Good morning and evening to all our online viewers, wherever you may be. My name is Russell Shell. I am the Executive Director of the Global Taiwan Institute, and I'll be your MC for today's event, GTI's fourth annual symposium on U.S.-Taiwan relations, building the foundation for a global partnership. It's my pleasure now to introduce GTI's chairman, Dr. Chen Wenyan, <clears throat> to offer the welcome remarks on behalf of GTI. Dr. Chen is the chairman of the board of directors at the Global Taiwan Institute. Dr. Chen was born in Taiwan, received his BS and MS degree from the National Taiwan University, and PhD in psychology from the City University of New York. Dr. Chen served as faculty, chairperson of the psychology department and associate dean of the College of Liberal and Fine Arts of the University of the District of Columbia. He has been involved in Taiwan's democracy movement since the Formosa incident in 1979, has served in various Taiwanese American organizations, including as president of the Northern American Taiwanese Prof Professors Association, president and executive director of the Formosa Association for Public Affairs, and also as an advisor to the Taiwan president's office. Over to you, Chairman Chen. Mr. Wu, Ambassador Xiao, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to our virtual annual fourth symposium on U.S.-Taiwan relationship. My name is Chen Wenyan, and I'm the chairman of the GTI. GTI is a privately funded 501c3 organization dedicated to providing a policy forum for discussing the relationship between Taiwan and other countries, especially the United States. Through research and programs such as Taiwan Brief, Public Seminar, Fellowship, Cultural Events, and Annual Symposium, our mission is to strengthen the relationship of Taiwan its people and culture with the international community, particularly now when its democratic way of life is increasingly under the threat by its communist neighbor. In the past year, we have seen the Chinese communist regime through its constant military exercises and its declared intent to so-called unify Taiwan by force if it is necessary threatening the peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait area. Its aggressive behavior in Northeast Asia, Hong Kong, South China Sea, and Indo-Sino border has elevated tension to a new level. <clears throat> China's predatory trade practices and the United States front tactics have raised a deep concern about the CCP's intention. As a result, we have seen a root awakening of the world, particularly United States, about the nature of the Chinese Communist regime and its threat to the democratic system of the world. Secretary of State Pompeo declared in July that our past policy of engagement has failed, and the CCP is a strategic competitor in dealing with CCP, he said, we must distrust and verify. We are now betting the disastrous coronavirus pandemic originating from Wuhan, China, because China's cover up and lack of transparency in containing the virus. The disease has spread throughout the world and caused almost 900,000 deaths worldwide, including 190,000 in the United States. It has wreaked the havoc on the world economy. Taiwan, because of its leadership and people, has done extremely well to contain this dreaded disease, only less than 500 infected and eight deaths. This remarkable achievement has earned much praise and respect worldwide. Taiwan even donated millions of pieces medical equipment to help other countries, including the United States. However, Taiwan, even though exceedingly successful containing the virus, is still rejected 
by the World Health Organization to become an observer. The pandemic and the security threat by the CCP have brought the United States and Taiwan closer than before. We have seen several congressional legislatures calling the greater cooperation in defense, trade, high-level widgets, and medical supply between the United States and Taiwan. We are also seeing that U.S. arms sales to Taiwan has become a normal process. The United States has upgraded and agreed to sell several weapon systems to Taiwan to help Taiwan defend itself. The recent announcement by the President Tsai to allow the import of American porks had paved the way for even closer trade and commercial relations between two countries. All of these new developments uh, and more had laid the foundation for further strengthening these ties between the United States and Taiwan. It has been said that the relationship between the two countries have been the best in years. It is a perfect timing now to have a group of distinguished experts to assess where the relationship are now and what future cooperative relationship would be in the coming years in areas of strategic cooperation, cross-strait relations, economic security, defense, and trade. I promise this is going to be an exciting to have the discussion, and it's a great honor for GTI to have you spending time with us in this virtual symposium. On behalf of GTI, I thank you for your participation, and please stay healthy during these difficult times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those excellent remarks and also for your leadership of GTI, uh, Chairman Chen. Uh, I would also add um, that all our programs uh, that we undertake here at GTI would not be possible without the general support and guidance uh, from our co-founders, board of directors, uh, and supporters. And, uh, and really, uh, again, uh, I cannot thank you enough uh, for the leadership that you have um, demonstrated uh, with this organization. I will, I will be also remiss if I did not thank our uh, wonderful staff here at GTI that make all our programs that we undertake here possible. Next, it is my honor to introduce Ambassador Shelby Kim, Taiwan's top diplomat to the United States, and the representative at the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, to also make some introductory remarks. Ambassador Xiao assumed her position as Taiwan's representative to the United States in July 2020, after serving as a senior advisor to the president at the National Security Council of Taiwan. Representative Xiao previously served four terms in Taiwan's legislature, representing overseas citizens uh, for the first term, and then the constituents of Taipei City and Hualien County uh, through different terms. For many years, she was the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee and previously the chair of the USA Caucus in the Legislative Yuan, Taiwan's parliament. Ambassador Xiao has taken on numerous leadership roles in international organizations. She was the chair of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats, an organization representing Asian Democratic political parties. And between 2005 and 2012, she was elected vice president of the Bureau of Liberal International, a London-based global political party organization. Over to you, Ambassador Shell. Well, thank you. Thank you, Russell, for your kind introduction. And also many thanks to Dr. Chen for facilitating uh, this uh, symposium and for inviting me to give a few welcoming remarks. It's certainly an honor and a pleasure to be joining you this morning. The distinguished lineup of speakers for this two-day discussion is powerful testament to GTI's impressive achievements in a relatively short span of time since its inception. And I'm sure our late president, Li Denghui, would have been very proud of GTI uh, accomplishments as its top advisor. Today's event is also 
clear affirmation of the ever strong bipartisan support Taiwan enjoys in Washington to date. I'm especially pleased to join this important timely discussion on how the U.S. and Taiwan can build the foundation for a global partnership. In fact, the top it resonates soundly with the mission I set out to do, and that is building on our strong bilateral ties, we can work to strengthen Taiwan's basic freedoms, hard-won democracy, comprehensive security, economic prosperity, and international participation. On the security side, we're now facing a double plague of COVID-19 pandemic and the Chinese Communist Party's increasingly belligerent aggression on the international stage. From the crackdown on Hong Kong's democracy, deadly clashes at Indian borders, to militarization of the South China Sea outposts, just a few days ago, the PLA warplanes made multiple incursions into Taiwan's southwestern ADIZ as China conducted massive drills within 90 nautical miles off Taiwan's coast and north of the Pradas or Dongsha Islands. Besides China's intensified military pressure, our open society in Taiwan constantly faces its frequent cyber attacks commercial espionage and disinformation campaigns. Under President Tsai's leadership, we've worked to counter these threats to strengthen our asymmetrical capabilities to deter aggression and enhance our public immunity against China's pervasive influence operations in our society. So we welcome Assistant Secretary Stilwell's reiteration of the six assurances of the United States. And we are committed on our part to playing, to playing our role in defending Taiwan and maintaining stability and peace in the region. On the economic front, this current pandemic has severely disrupted the global economy, and yet Taiwan stands out as not only a model of public health and human security, but an important link in global supply chain security. To further strengthen our economic partnership, President Tsai's announcement to remove restrictions on American pork and beef imports was met by outpouring support from U.S. officials, members of Congress, and the business communities here. In the ever more volatile global economic environment, there is no better time than now to start pursuing a bilateral trade agreement that will bring tremendous benefits to our peoples. We are hopeful that Taiwan's resolve to tackle the difficult trade issues will demonstrate our commitment to international standards and our determination to further integrate with the global economy. Finally, the challenges today present a golden strategic opportunity for Taiwan's global participation and cooperation. The silver lining of Taiwan's leading success in containing the coronavirus and its selfless donations of PPEs and surgical masks to those in need has garnered much more friendship and support from like-minded countries to speak up for the 23 million good citizens of Taiwan in international organizations such as the World Health Organization, the Assembly, and the UN General Assembly. Meanwhile, the Taiwan-U.S. Global Cooperation and Training Framework, otherwise known as GCTF, continues to thrive. Just last week, the U.S., Taiwan, Japan, and Guatemala joined forces to host the first GCTF virtual workshop focused on Latin America and the Caribbean region. And we are always looking to call on more partners through innovative and effective platforms like the GCTF. Thanks to the support of Congress in passing the Taipei Act, the intensity and scope of our cooperation has expanded to unprecedented levels.
Now, let me conclude by echoing President Tsai's call for a democratically allied framework to generate sustained and concerted efforts to maintain a strategic order that encourages cooperation, transparency, and problem solving through dialogue, not threats of war. We need a strategy that avoids war, yet clearly conveys our resolve to protect our democracies. And with that, I thank GTI for convening this important annual symposium. And I look forward to the stellar keynotes from my Minister of Foreign Affairs and from my American counterparts here, as well as insightful and engaging discussion in the following expert panels. Thank you and stay healthy. Those words about GTI, Ambassador Xiao, uh, your comments were incredibly thoughtful and they offer a lot of food for, for, food for thought for us as we um, proceed with the opening keynote and panel discussion. Uh, we look forward to uh, working uh, with TechRo uh, under your leadership and uh, look forward to um, future opportunities to, to cooperate. Thank you again very much. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce the opening keynote speech uh, for GTI's 2020 annual symposium with a video recorded message from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Taiwan, His Excellency Dr. Joseph Wu. Dr. Joseph Wu, prior to his current appointment as the Foreign Minister, served as the Secretary General of the Office of the President, Secretary General of the National Security Council, Representative of Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States, as Chairman of the Mainland Affairs Council, among many other senior government, as well as positions within the Democratic Progressive Party. As an administrative note, after Minister Wu's remarks, we will transition automatically to the first panel of the symposium. Please note that there may be a slight pause between the programs. Please play the video recorded message from Foreign Minister Wu. Dr. Chen Wenyan, Chairman of the Global Taiwan Institute, Russell Shaw. GTI's Executive Director, dear friends and colleagues in Washington, D.C., ladies and gentlemen, good morning. good morning. It is a great honor to be invited to speak at the Global Taiwan Institute's annual symposium once again. I would like to congratulate GTI on its fourth anniversary. Since GTI's inception in 2016, the seeds you have sown have sprouted and flourished. As the scope of your research and projects expands, you have become ever more influential in DC policy circles. Your efforts to advance Taiwan-US relations are much appreciated. This is my third time to speak at GTI's annual symposium. Every year provides new opportunities to reaffirm Taiwan-US relations and gain French insights. This year, I'm going to cover a variety of topics and discuss how thriving relations have been marked by concrete progress. The year 2020 has been a difficult one for all of us. Since surfacing in Wuhan, China late last year, COVID-19 has ravaged the globe with astonishing speed, devastating lives and livelihoods, and tremendously impacting the world economy. The damage could have no doubt been mitigated had the Chinese Communist Party warned the world sooner. It was revealed only too late that the CCP has concealed and withheld crucial information from the World Health Organization. Only then did the international community fully realize that the threat posed by an authoritarian regime like the CCP could no longer be ignored. Thankfully, in Taiwan, we have defied expectations with fewer than 500 confirmed cases, mostly imported. Taiwan's successful containment of the pandemic hinged on a rapid deployment of the Central Epidemic Command Center, stringent border controls and quarantine procedures, and transparent information sharing. We also took swift action to ensure ample stocks of medical supplies made available to our citizens. 
the government of Taiwan gained public trust during the pandemic by being responsive and transparent, two key elements of a democratic society. Taiwan's example clearly demonstrates that a free and democratic society can be more effective at crisis management than an authoritarian regime. After securing sufficient supplies domestically, we began providing medical equipment and supplies to countries in need. By the end of August, Taiwan had donated 54.5 million medical masks and other critical supplies to over 80 countries. Recognizing Taiwan's efforts, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo publicly stated that Taiwan's openness and generosity in the global battle against COVID-19 is a model for the world. Just last month, I was delighted to receive U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, the highest ranking U.S. cabinet official to have visited Taiwan since 1979. His visit sent a powerful message to Taiwan and the world, demonstrating that the United States fully backs Taiwan. This is true both with regard to combating COVID-19 and also safeguarding democracy in the face of authoritarian aggression. Winning the war on COVID-19 requires cooperation. No nation can do it alone. Unfortunately, Taiwan has been excluded from WHO and many other international platforms dedicated to tackling the pandemic. In this regard, we are particularly grateful for the strong show of support from the United States. One notable example is the Taiwan Allies International Protection and Enhancement Initiative Act of 2019, or the Taipei Act, passed by the U.S. Congress and signed into law by President Trump. The act reaffirms U.S. support for Taiwan's diplomatic alliances worldwide and Taiwan's international participation. On August 31st, the U.S. government declassified two diplomatic cables, one regarding arms sale to Taiwan and the other discussing the six assurances the Reagan administration made to Taiwan in 1982. The release of the documents is timely. It serves as a testament to the long-standing U.S. support for Taiwan and staunch commitment to Taiwan's security. As the American Institute in Taiwan indicated, the six assurances have been a foundational element in U.S. policy toward Taiwan and the PRC. We are grateful to our American friends who have supported Taiwan by faithfully implementing these policies over the past decades. Now I would like to discuss the economic aspect of Taiwan-U.S. relations. The onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic has severely impacted international trade and triggered one of the world's global economic slowdown in decades. The pandemic has also highlighted the importance of supply chain security from medical supplies vaccines and medicines to high-tech equipment. Taiwan is willing and able to cooperate with the United States in these areas. Moreover, as a hub of cutting-edge technology in semiconductor manufacturing and other high-tech domains, Taiwan can play a pivotal role in the global supply chain restructuring and serve as a reliable partner for critical infrastructure and next-generation technology. On August 26, I announced a joint declaration on 5G security with AIT Director Brent Christensen to safeguard transparent and trustworthy telecommunications networks. And Taiwan's five major telecom service providers are designated as clean 5G carriers by the United States. On August 28th, President Tsai announced that Taiwan's restrictions on U.S. beef and pork imports will be eased. The announcement has been welcomed by U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, Secretary of Agriculture Sunny Perdue, and many friends on Capitol Hill. As President Tsai said, our move will be an important starting point for more comprehensive Taiwan-U.S. economic cooperation. We sincerely hope that these will open doors and pave the way for substantive talks on closer trade ties, including a BTA. In the post-pandemic era, a bilateral trade agreement is more important than ever, as it will benefit both sides by stimulating our respective economies, creating more jobs, and enhancing supply chain security. 
In addition to this, Taiwan and the United States are preparing to launch the economic and commercial dialogue with Mr. Keith Kroc, Under Secretary of State as the U.S. lead. I'm positive that this new high-level dialogue will take our economic relations to the next level. In addition to economic challenges, Taiwan also faces increasing military pressure from China. Beijing has been ramping up aggressive military maneuvers to intimidate Taiwan. This year, PLA's aircraft have repeatedly violated Taiwan's air defense identification zone and cut through the medium line of the Taiwan Strait. The reckless and provocative actions by PLA has heightened the tensions to a new level. China's behavior demonstrates that under the facade of confidence it projects to the world lies a grave apprehension. However, as President Tsai has emphasized, Taiwan will not engage in rash behavior, nor succumb to China's oppression or provocation. I would like to thank the U.S. government for supporting the enhancement of Taiwan's self-defense capabilities. In the past four years, the Trump administration has approved seven arms sale packages to Taiwan, totaling 13.2 billion U.S. dollars. Looking ahead, we will further develop and bolster our indigenous defense and asymmetrical warfare capabilities. We will also continue working with the United States and other like-minded nations to defend Taiwan from China's manipulations and threats. Confronted with Chinese Communist regime, Taiwan is on the front lines defending democracy. Beijing wants to shake our people's confidence in democracy and coerce Taiwan to accept its political framework through intimidation, economic threats, and disinformation. This has put Taiwan in a difficult position. Nevertheless, the people of Taiwan are determined to preserve their democratic way of life. Even under the threat of COVID-19, we have not deviated from the democratic values. The pandemic has presented a unique opportunity to demonstrate Taiwan's commitment to transparency and freedom. The Taiwan model has proven that, as opposed to authoritarian regimes where transparency is a luxury, democracies are far better equipped in anti-pandemic fights. When I say Taiwan is on the front lines of democracy, I really mean it. The situation of the region is deteriorating at a disturbing pace. China has extended its reach far beyond the Taiwan Strait and escalated tensions in the region from the East and South China Seas to the Sino-Indian border. China's human rights violations against Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, and other religious minorities have also raised great concerns. In my opinion, these mass atrocities committed by Chinese authorities against the minorities, including modern-day slavery, forced sterilization, constitute crimes against humanity. Hong Kong is a particularly worrying case. By enacting the Hong Kong National Security Law, China imposed an Orwellian system on Hong Kong, a city once known for its freedom and openness. This draconian law is also an unprecedented show of Chinese expansionist aims, and it contravenes international law. It is such a tragedy of our time. Against this backdrop, the current challenges facing Taiwan are not just about Taiwan's status in the international community, but also about the survival of democracy. Taiwan is committed to defending our free and democratic way of life against Chinese expansionism. And if democracy is to win, Taiwan must prevail. And I want to emphasize that democracies around the world must cooperate and continue to defend our shared values. Only then will freedom ultimately triumph. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Foreign Minister Wu. Um, I think those were some excellent scene-setting uh, comments uh, from the Taiwanese Foreign Minister. From the fundamental impact of the novel coronavirus on geopolitics to the acceleration of the nascent realignment of the economic and political systems, Taiwan's role in serving as a model not only for combating this pandemic, 
but also for tackling other global issues through its Taiwan model has been clearly on display. Um, as we look to the future, especially in a post-pandemic order, it would be a serious failure of our imagination to not see the need to reassess and reconsider Taiwan's role and place in the international community. Indeed, these events and Taiwan's rise as a reliable democratic ally on the front line uh, of the strategic competition uh, with, the, uh, with revisionist authoritarian powers and an ICT powerhouse highlight the need for an increasingly global scope of the bilateral relationship, which had been previously constrained by self-imposed restrictions and outdated policies. All this underscore potential areas to further U.S.-Taiwan cooperation uh, that recognize the full potential of what Taiwan has to offer to the world. Of course, the necessary foundation for those improvements and expansion stem from the solid and steady enhancements of the bilateral U.S.-Taiwan relationship that have been firmly established on the Taiwan Relations Act and the Six Assurances. And in recent years, the Taiwan Travel Act, as well as the Taip Taiwan Allies International Protection and Enhancement Initiative. As with previous symposiums, this first panel on global strategy and co cooperation is the framing session where we will paint the overall operating picture. First, we will discuss the regional and global dynamics at work by addressing the various strategies taken by some countries in the region, such as Japan, Australia, India, and the United States toward the Indo-Pacific, and explore potential avenues for development and cooperation for and with Taiwan. Um, now I'd like to invite um, our conference moderator to in, uh, include our speakers. Uh, I truly do not think we could have found a more exceptionally qualified and distinguished group of practitioners, people who have served or are serving right now in senior levels of their governments to help paint this picture for us or a better timing to host this conference as many of, uh, uh, of the speakers prior have already indicated, especially in light of U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Dave Stilwell's major Taiwan policy speech that he delivered two weeks ago at the Heritage Foundation, where he announced meaningful adjustments in the U.S. approach to and clarified U.S. policy towards Taiwan. On top of everything, it is also International Day of Democracy. Now, each of the speakers uh, who we have assembled here today deserves a lengthy and full introduction to highlight their many professional and academic accomplishments. But in the interest of time, I would just highlight some of their CV. Uh, for their full biographies, you may download the conference handbook on our website at www.globaltaiwan.org on the annual symposium page. Uh, I'll introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. First, we have Randy Schreiber, who is the chairman of the board at the Project 2049 Institute, a forward-looking, region-specific think tank focused on researching alternative security and policy solutions. Most recently, Mr. Schreiber served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs uh, from January 2018 to December 2019. And prior to his confirmation as Assistant Secretary, uh, Randy was a founding partner of Armitage International, a consulting firm that specializes in international business development and strategies. Uh, Randy has also served in the U.S. military and have has countless other uh, uh, other accomplishments that uh, you may find on on their organization's website. Next, we have Ashley Tellis, uh, who holds the Tata Chair for Strategic Affairs and is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace specializing in international security and U.S. foreign and defense policy, with a special focus on Asia and the Indian subcontinent. While on assignment uh, to the U.S. Department of State as senior advisor to the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, uh, he advised on critical issues related to U.S. policy uh, towards India. 
He also served on the National Security Council staff as special assistant to the uh, to President George W. Bush and as Senior Director for Strategic Planning in Southwest Asia. Next, we have Nobukatsu Kanehara, who is a professor of Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, Nobu served as Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe from 2012 to 2019. In 2013, he also became the inaugural Deputy Secretary General of the National Security Secretariat. He also served as Deputy Director of the Cabinet Intelligence and Research Office. Mr. Kanehara served in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as Director General of the Bureau of International Law, Deputy Director General of the Foreign Policy Bureau, Ambassador in Charge of the United Nations and Human Rights, as well as the Deputy Director General of European Affairs in Charge of Russia and Eastern Europe. Next, we have John Lee was a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, DC. He's also a senior fellow at the United States Study Center and adjunct professor at the University of Sydney. From 2012 and 2018, he was senior national security advisor to Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. Uh, in this role, he served as the principal advisor on Asia and economic and strategic and political affairs in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and Dr. Lee was also appointed the Foreign Minister's Lead Advisor on the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, the first comprehensive foreign affairs blueprint for Australia since 2003. Last but not least, we have Vincent Chow, who is the Director of the Political Division at the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. Prior to this role, he served as the Chief of Staff to Taiwan's Foreign Minister and senior level government positions at the Office of the President as well as the National Security Council. As you can see, we've assembled an incredible and, and exceptionally qualified group of experts and we're really delighted to have this conversation. I've asked each of the speakers to prepare around 10 minutes uh, for an opening statement. After that, after all the speakers finish, I'll moderate a discussion when, uh, and we'll close with around 15 minutes at the end of, at the, end of the session for audience Q&A. If you would like to ask questions, uh, you may send your questions to contact at globaltaiwan.org or use the chat function on the YouTube page or even tweet us at Global Taiwan. Uh, make sure to include your name as well as affiliation when, uh, uh, when posing your question. I'll repeat this, uh, these instructions again uh, later in the program. Randy, over to you. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Russell. It's really uh, great to be with you all this morning. And uh, my own participation notwithstanding, this is, a, this is an extraordinary panel. I'm really honored to share the uh, virtual podium with, with Ashley and John and Vincent and uh, Nobu. Great to see you uh, joining us as well. Um, Ten minutes uh, as for some framing remarks is a bit of a challenge, but uh, I'm eager to hear the others. So I'll try to, to stick to that time frame. Russell asked me to talk about uh, strategic competition and the role of Taiwan, U.S.-Taiwan relations beyond 2020. And I think to properly do that, uh, we have to have a, a reminder of what this strategic competition is about and, and what we're competing for and why I think uh, once that's accomplished, why Taiwan's role is increasing in its importance and why U.S.-Taiwan relations will be absolutely critical going forward. Now, the nature of this competition is not just for supremacy or primacy for primacy's sake. It's really about promoting and protecting and sustaining the free and open qualities of the Indo-Pacific. We maintain a military edge. We want to maintain uh, other advantages in order to preserve those qualities, not because we want to see China fail, not because we value our own primacy so much. It's really that collective shared goal of promoting those free and open qualities. And that's why Taiwan is growing in importance and will be a strategic partner in this effort for as far as my eyes can see. Uh, now, I, I think it's important to make a distinction to say that, that Taiwan is growing importance because of US-China competition. This is not the, the old model where Taiwan is sort of a, a subset of US-China relations or Taiwan is an issue to manage in the context of US-China relations. What I'm speaking about is, is leveraging the fact that Taiwan as a like-minded partner, as a country, shares the interest in promoting those free and open qualities 
uh, rule of law, international norms, uh, free, open, and reciprocal trade, and the like. That's why Taiwan is growing in importance. So if you look at our competition with China uh, across variety of domains, and, and much of this has already been addressed in excellent open re opening remarks by uh, Foreign Minister Wu and Ambassador Xiao, but across multiple domains, uh, Taiwan is, is growing as an important partner to us. So for example, security, we've already talked about uh, what Taiwan is doing to strengthen its own defenses. But I would argue that Taiwan's security and defense and continued existence has implications beyond just the well-being of the 23 million people of Taiwan. I've been saying recently that Taiwan is really a modern day fold a gap in Asia. If you remember the uh, fold a gap in, in Europe, the context that this was not only the most likely place where the US and the Soviets would clash given the uh, posture of troops and the, the major artillery and tanks aligned there, but it was also seen as the most strategic ground. And if you were to lose the Volta Gap, you would be very hard pressed to protect the West, the rest of Western Europe and the rest of NATO. Uh, and I think if you pull out a map of Taiwan today and, and the region, uh, you'll see the similarities that the loss of Taiwan really then threatens the entire first and second island chain, certainly threatens the South China Sea and beyond. So as much as uh, I, I carry a personal affinity for Taiwan and Taiwan's well-being, uh, Taiwan's continued survival existence and its ability to prevent PRC domination is really uh, broader than just the interests of Taiwan. It's really the uh, future of the uh, security of the region and all the things we value. So when we talk about helping Taiwan implement its overall defense concept, the critical capabilities that are needed there, it's really with that in mind that there are very broad implications for Taiwan to continue to exist and, and survive and prevent uh, any PRC domination. I think the same is true with trade. Uh, we've advocated at my institute for a free trade agreement uh, for decades. And I think it's a key part of strengthening U.S. Taiwan relations, certainly there would be mutual benefit to trade liberalization that opens key sectors for one another. But once again, it really goes beyond the bilateral relationship. When you look at the effort that's being launched uh, with this new economic dialogue, and you look at the types of things that will be discussed, we start to understand that it's really more than, than the benefit of US Taiwan. It's really about uh, global economic security, about the integrity of supply chains. So we, I think, have broad agreement on concepts. It's critically important that we move from concept to, to specificity. We talk about a shared understanding of where there are risks in the uh, global supply chain, uh, down into certain sectors, uh, what we regard as uh, vulnerabilities, what we regard as key capabilities that China's trying to acquire through uh, whatever means in its uh, civil military fusion efforts to try to improve its own military capabilities and really come up with a joint plan and approach that protects our security, but has those broader implications as well for global supply chain security. I'd say the same on the, on the diplomatic front. Um, it is, I think, very important that the United States join Taiwan and trying to preserve Taiwan's diplomatic allies. When I look at the map again, and I think about regional implications, and I start to look at Palau, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Tuvalu, I see the potential for really strategic outposts of freedom, given the competition that's underway throughout the entire Pacific region. If those countries continue to choose to stay on sides with Taiwan, it's, it's not just a choice about that bilateral relationship. It's one that we all benefit from. So I fully endorse U.S. efforts to try to uh, keep those countries aligned with Taiwan and aligned with the, the uh, goals of promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific. I think the uh, international space that's already been talked about is also crucial. I, I think the GCTF is, is a brilliant initiative, and I was so glad to see, as, as Minister Wu mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, plans to expand this, to think about other regions. Uh, GCTF can be expeditionary, if you will. These events don't have to be held only in Taiwan uh, or the U.S. We can take a GCTF framework with our Japanese friends uh, included. I, I note that uh, uh, Mr. Izumi was alongside during that recent uh, statement about strengthening GCTF. We can take that framework and, and be expeditionary, do events in other regions, other parts of the world to promote the, the, uh, the uh, benefits to a wider and, and more diverse audience. 
I think at, at this point, human rights and, and uh, the ideological components of this competition, Taiwan is growing in importance. The response to the situation in Hong Kong, I think Taiwan has uh, behaved very admirably and, and been a, a place of uh, refuge for Hong Kong activists and others. That will continue to be important, but just continuing to be that shining example and being uh, a very stark contrast to what's happening in, in uh, mainland China. Uh, you know, there are a number of important milestones approaching, and I would just point to the Beijing Olympics in 2022, uh, Winter Olympics this time. Um, you know, you'll hear a lot of debate about what flag Taiwan can march under or what terms will their participation be. Uh, I would argue the bigger question is uh, having an Olympic Games with the world watching while simultaneously running concentra concentration camps and the western part of your country and having these severe uh, atrocities and human rights uh, issues throughout the countries and to include targeting of the minority populations that Minister Wu mentioned. Uh, we have to think long and hard about uh, not only our participation, I know some have called uh, for boycotts, but if our athletes do participate, how we as a country, uh, as a government, as, as uh, partners can use that ceremony and, and those games, not just as a spotlight on Chinese success and, and their greatness, uh, but really to shine a light on some of the other uh, more troubling areas. And, and I think Taiwan can play a role in that. So this sort of leads me to uh, conclude that uh, Taiwan is growing importance, as I said. And there's one question that's that's hanging out there right now that, that has received some press attention, and that's this notion of continued policy of strategic ambiguity or moving into something else uh, such as st strategic clarity. And, and Richard Haas and others have written on it and talked about it. Uh, I think given where we are and given the importance that, that I've just described and other speakers have and will describe, uh, we need to think about moving towards strategic clarity and tactical ambiguity. My good friend, Kurt Campbell, uh, I think created this formula, at least the, the uh, mantra of strategic clarity and tactical ambiguity. And what I mean by that and, and what, what we can continue to build out is that the strategic clarity part, it is in our strategic interest for Taiwan's continued existence, survival and success. It is not in our strategic interest. It is against our interest for Taiwan to be absorbed into the uh, in, into the one China system as long as the CCP is in power and probably well beyond that. Uh, so we have a strategic interest in Taiwan's continued success. The tactical ambiguity, of course, would have to be preserved because we don't want to forecast what we would do in a particular contingency. But having identified the strategic clarity, having talked about uh, even back in the 80s, uh, why we issued the six assurances, all of this should uh, convey to the world and convey to, to Beijing and convey to Taipei the importance uh, we place on Taiwan and, and Taiwan's continued survival and, and certainly then bolster that deterrent quality. So Russell, thanks for the uh, opportunity to share the platform here with great colleagues and I look forward to their remarks. Ready, uh, terrific, terrific comments. I, I think that was that was an excellent first play in terms of uh, opening up uh, the first session of our, our, of our, um, our two, two half day sem uh, symposium. Your point about you know moving beyond concepts to you know really sort of focusing on specific is really precisely uh, what I hope we can uh, do not only with this panel but successive panels and discussions with experts to really sort of start moving the ball forward a bit on some of the I think big, uh, ideas that have been formulated and 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 put forward uh, you know uh, particularly in recent years uh, you know while you were were, were in government. And, um, and 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 so and I think you know I want to return back to uh, when we had the, the, the discussion the point about the need to preserve Taiwan's diplomatic partners in third regions where I think it hasn't been um, not enough attention has been paid to that at least before recent years and and I think there's a lot of room there for us to really explore potential avenues of cooperation. Um, so next, I'd like to turn it over to uh, to Ashley uh, to give us a a, a broader uh, scope, if you will, on the uh, on the, on our discussion today. Well, thank you, Russell. It's a pleasure to be here at uh, the annual symposium, and as Randy mentioned, to actually share the stage, as it were, uh, with a group of friends with whom I've been privileged to work uh, for many years. Uh, thank you for asking me to speak on the question of the free and open Indo-Pacific and the possibilities for India and Taiwan. Uh, 
Let me start by saying that I see the free and Indo-Pacific, uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific concept as being one of the most substantive legacies uh, that this administration will pass uh, into uh, contemporary history. And even if uh, the elections in November uh, result in a change in the US presidency, I believe that the notion of a free and open Indo-Pacific will survive, even if it takes on another name precisely because the challenges it focuses on are truly enduring challenges that the United States and its partners will have to manage uh, for many decades, uh, for many decades to come. And there are three elements in the concept that I think are worth flagging because uh, this is really going to define the architecture of the region uh, in the years ahead. Uh, the first facet that is worth remembering is that after a long time, the unity of the Indian Ocean and the Asia Pacific is finally realized. And the fact that uh, both uh, sub uh, regions affect the destinies of the other have now become part of the strategic calculations of each of the regional as well as the extra regional states. That's an important advance. Uh, the second is the recognition all around that we need integrated strategies, political, military, and economic, uh, to manage China's rise and to push back on its assertiveness. Uh, Ten years ago, this would have been a controversial proposition. Uh, today, even in the United States, it's where the dominant uh, body of opinion uh, on U.S. policy is. And the third... Uh, is that there is a clear need for intermeshing networks of partnerships, which bring together a wide variety of America's friends and allies uh, in order to preserve uh, the openness and the freedom uh, of the Indo-Pacific, both for our own security and to enhance prosperity. I think these are huge gains, and I'm hopeful that these gains will survive precisely because the awareness of the importance of these issues now pervades the entire region. And I do not, uh, I cannot uh, overemphasize how transformative uh, these three elements potentially can be as we think about the challenges of dealing with China uh, in the out years. Now, in this context, going to the uh, specific issues that you asked me to reflect upon. I think the fact that India has now made a commitment to the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, is really important. Remember, this is a country that has had a long history of non-alignment, a long history of distance uh, from multilateral endeavors. India has attempted to play different poles off against each other in the international system, never joining in terms of a larger coalition of states that are united by values, interests, and capabilities. And so for the fact that the Indian government over a period of now 20 years has slowly been gravitating towards thinking of the Indo-Pacific as a unified space, and that Prime Minister Modi in particular most recently has strongly endorsed the concept, uh, to my mind is the crossing of an important threshold uh, that we ought not to lose sight of. Now, the critics, you know, are quick to point to the differences between the Indian vision of the free and open Indo-Pacific and the vision held by the United States and those of its partners. Of course, these differences exist because everyone looks at the free and open Indo-Pacific through the prism of national interests. But I think harping on the differences misses the larger point. The larger point is that there is a clear recognition in India about the threats posed by choking Chinese dominance to Asian security and to Asian prosperity. And the Indian desire to advocate, to commit to a free and open Indo-Pacific, even if on its own terms, implies a commitment to push back on China unilaterally when necessary, bilaterally with the United States when possible, and multilaterally at all times. And I think this shift in Indian policy 
really creates the preconditions for building new balancing strategies uh, towards China that will survive this administration and many administrations yet to come. And it creates opportunities for India to discover the potential for new partnerships. And there are two partnerships in particular that I want to flag here because they are central in India's calculations uh, to preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific. The first, of course, is the partnership with Japan, with whom uh, India has had a long-standing uh, desire for closer ties. And increasingly, the partnerships with Australia and Taiwan, they're two different entities uh, in terms of Indian calculations. But as India begins to think of its engagement in the Indo-Pacific, I think uh, outside of the United States, uh, the triadic relationship between uh, Japan, India, and Taiwan will become uh, very uh, important in Indian calculations. Now, the Indians are uh, always acutely aware of the realities of balance of power politics. They recognize that China is a large and powerful neighbor sitting uh, right at their doorstep. And managing China involves uh, a great deal of complexities. It involves managing contradictions in Indian policies towards China, uh, towards China. And that has resulted in a certain reticence in the way India advertises its ties uh, with Taiwan. But that reticence about advertising uh, should not be confused with a reticence about the desirability for strengthening relations. My own argument uh, to our Indian colleagues uh, in government and in Indian public policy would be to say that the time uh, of Indian reticence is actually long over. Uh, India should move uh, more clearly towards building bridges with Taiwan for a variety of reasons. Uh, Taiwan's own new southbound policy and India's Act East policy have tremendous con convergences uh, in the economic space. And if for no other reason, there is a compelling argument uh, for India to deepen its economic ties with Taiwan, uh, precisely because as Randy flagged, Taiwan is a great success story. Taiwan has been able to demonstrate that uh, you do not need an authoritarian regime uh, to experience uh, supernormal economic growth, to become a leader in innovation, to be able to build the capabilities, diplomatic, all the way to the military that enable you to stand up to China. Uh, so there are complementarities that India ought to exploit, and these, goes, and these go beyond the economic. I think there's also a very strong case for enlarged uh, strategic engagement. Even though the strategic engagement will largely be uh, tacit, uh, will largely be uh, quiet, uh, will largely take place uh, you know, through sort of innuendo, uh, but that is worth, that is worth pursuing uh, and building. And of course, I think there is an argument to be made for much more vocal Indian support uh, for Taiwan's membership uh, in international organizations and in the broader Indian space. It carries weight because India speaks uh, with particular influence in the global south. Uh, it matters because of India's uh, credentials in the international community. And it matters because India is also uh, a fellow democracy which is challenged uh, by China in parallel ways uh, to the way China is uh, threatening Taiwan. So the bottom line for me is that because India now has firsthand experience uh, about Chinese assertiveness and what that means uh, for Asia, uh, India can afford to be much more open in terms of the building of a new relationship with Taiwan. Uh, today, uh, an Indian government does not have to swim against the tide in terms of deepening uh, ties with Taipei. After the events of the last few months on the Sino-Indian border, there has been a huge upsurge in Indian public opinion, arguing that New Delhi should deepen ties with Taipei for the simple reason that Beijing feels no compulsions, uh, compunctions about building ties with India's adversaries in the region. And uh, consequently, 
India should feel free uh, to play the game just as China has demonstrated it can play in recent years. Uh, more to the point, uh, for India, the competition with China is not notional. India has actually now lost blood uh, for the first time uh, in, 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 uh, in 40 or 45 years. And it continues to lose a great deal of treasure in, in, in competing with China. I think Prime Minister Modi's instincts take him in this direction. Uh, but the time to act on those instincts more forcefully and more openly is now. Because I think there are huge gains, not only for India, but also for Taiwan. And the broader US strategy of building a set of partnerships, uh, which are designed uh, to deal with the realities of an assertive uh, ascent in China. Uh, my last thought is that this is a moment of truth in many ways uh, for the international community. Uh, if we don't collectively uh, work uh, to balance China, uh, we will simply end up hanging separately. And that's not a nice position to be in uh, for anyone who happens to have the misfortune of being located on China's periphery today. Thank you. Really excellent remarks, Ashley. I think um, you know, your, um, your your point about the, 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 the sort of the removal of the reticence of among Indian policymakers towards Taiwan is is borne out by uh, some you know in addition to public opinion, but uh, a recent um, announcement that the Indian government appointed a top career diplomat to be its representative to Taiwan. I believe this is the former head of the U.S. division. Um, of, of the uh, India's Ministry of External Affairs. So I think that's an interesting combination to look at how India is moving closer up with the United States at the same time, you know, appointing a top career diplomat who focuses on U.S. as their uh, you know, top representative in, in Taiwan. And, uh, and I think your point about the, the substantive legacy of, of entry and open Indo-Pacific will be very reassuring to a lot of partners and allies in the region. Uh, looking at the you know, U.S. election and wondering what will happen next, and I think that's um, and that that's going to be um, uh, that that's you know, and that's because the challenge that China presents, of course, is an enduring one, and 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 so the reasons and causes for uh, the need to cooperate among each other, and and certainly uh, in our context when dealing and, and working with Taiwan is um, you know uh, is, is 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 essential, um, and so. Uh, next, I'd like to move over to uh, Nobukatsu Kanehara. Um, the a discussion about uh, Taiwan uh, in the context of U.S.-Taiwan relations would be impossible uh, without a discussion about Japan uh, as well. Uh, not only for, of course, the importance of Japan as um, you know a security ally of the United States, but also for the the, in, the, the ties between uh, Japan and Taiwan as well. Uh, so I'm really delighted that uh, we can welcome uh, Mr. Kanehara uh, to share his views. Over well, thank you very much, Russell, for having me. Hi, Randy, Hi, Ashley, John, Vincent. Very good to talk with you. Let me start by uh, pointing out the importance of Taiwan for, for us and for, uh, for the world. Japan is now saying FOIP with Americans in free and open in the Pacific. And the point is, liberal order in Asia is now finally emerging. During the Cold War time, democracies were only India and Japan, others were dictators. We said it's free world in Asia, but it was full of dictators there. But in 1980s, 1990s, around the end of the Cold War, many Asian nations got developed quickly, and they turned into democracy one by one. The first was the Philippines, 1986, Aquino, and then 1987 was Korea. And one by one, many Asian nations turned to democracy, and they're very proud, young, but very proud democracies. Taiwan became a crown jewel in 1990s democratization history in Asia. It's Lee Fei. He was genius. He brought Taiwan to democracy with the Kuomintang. He said, I'm Taiwanese. And he turns Taiwan into a full democracy. Proud of it. And we have Japanese a particular love for Taiwan, your longtime neighbor. We're together once 
and at earthquake time at Tohoku, we never forget what Taiwan did to the Japanese. I have to say that Taiwan is population is as big as Australia, 23 million. It's a huge, it's a huge de facto nation. And the size of Malaysia, and I have to say it's big economy, it's bigger than Poland, it's bigger than Israel, it's bigger than any other ASEAN nations than Indonesia, it's bigger than Thailand, it's bigger than Vietnam, it's bigger than the Philippines. Military power is, is a substantial one, 200,000 200, forces. It's land, it's island as big as our Kyushu Islands, many high mountains higher than Mount Fuji. It's not easy to attack these islands and occupy it smoothly. It's a very difficult time to take. And this is in the first island chain here. We are facing Russians. Our Okinawan islands are facing Chinese. Taiwan is here. It's Okinawa. It's Taiwan. And this is Luzon and Indonesia, Malaysia. Taiwan is pivotal. And strategically, this is very important for us. Let me point out then how big China is today. Ten years ago, China was our size. Twenty years ago, it was not even panda. It was a big cat. We pulled their their hands into the West. We pushed them to, into the WTO. Even after Tiananmen massacre, we asked our His Majesty to go to Tiananmen to shake Chinese hands. They were so happy to break ice with the West. We believed that they would be like us one day. Unfortunately, they are now very different. China is now three times bigger than us in terms of the economy. That's 70% of the United States. When Japan fought Pacific War, our industrial size was 10% of US. In Nazi Germany, 40%. Today's China is twice as big as Nazi Germany and <laughs> Imperial Japan. It's Chinese size today. Their military budget is now four times bigger than ours. It's smaller than the American ones, but our military budget the size of that's a bit smaller than India, but the size of British, French, Germans. That means Chinese military budget today is bigger than Japan plus UK plus France plus Germany. It's a huge money. It's part in PLA today. That's today's China. And if they are on the track inside the Western system, happy with the permanent seat in Security Council, happy in WTO, Cooperating, cooperating with us for, say, climate to change, and they are not. That's a big concern for us. We started to notice some big strategic change in Beijing as early as 2009. After the Lehman shock, China helped us. In 1970s, Japan, Germany put out world economy out of the big downturn with Americans. That's how we rehabilitated our international status. G7 summit meeting was created and Japan, Germany were invited. Lehman shock was the same for the Chinese. They saw Americans collapsing. Japanese, Europeans, Chinese pulled out, pulled world economy out of the collapse. And they felt we are number one. That's a very erroneous self-image, but that's how, that's how China felt. And then Xiaoping said, hide your teeth, hide your nails, wait for the wait for the day. That's the teaching of Deng Xiaoping. That's a bit earlier that they pulled off all the masks, then they show their teeth and the dents, teeth and nails. Dragon is now dragon. And what we saw is one, the expansionism in South China Sea. They're picking up their islands as they wish. And they militarize the reefs, rocks, South China Sea. They ripped off islands from Vietnam, arresting Vietnamese vessels every day. And they, are, they started to bully American allies. Amazing, isn't it? 2012, Senkaka Island, Scarborough. They started to touch upon American allies. 2020, 2012, Scarborough was taken. And the Philippines brought this case to the court. 
China neglects completely the sentence judgment of the court. We are pushing back Chinese vessels every day. It's a huge amount of waste of time and energy, but we have to cope with them. Otherwise, Senkaku will be like Scarborough's. And this is where we are. And in the China, borders are skirmishes everywhere. They're bogging down Indian soldiers. We don't understand why they are doing this in Natsuna Islands in, of Indonesia, beyond the equator. They are sending in their vessels. They never send in naval vessels simply because they do not want to confront Americans. But enough, it's enough to send in militia vessels or coast guard vessels to bully lesser nations in Asia. This is what they are doing today. We don't understand why they are doing that, but 2006, we have to remember, they filed a paper to the United Nations claiming that the whole South, South China Sea is a Chinese sea. We looked into the archives, we could never find a historical paper to sustain this. Yuan's, Mongols, Qin's, Manchus, they were horse riders, they're not sailors. And in Ming Dynasty, they closed the door to the, out, the, to the, to the, to the outer trade. So the Japanese pilots were there everywhere. And then Europeans came in, British, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and they controlled the sea. China was never been a major player at sea in the South China Sea. This paper of 9-9, the famous one, to say the South China Sea is the Chinese Sea, is a fake made by Kuomintang in 1930s. That's what you found. And we cannot go along with that. But why, why are they doing this? Why, why are they saying this? It's simple. In 1982, a famous scholar of the Chinese Navy, Liu Huaqing, he wrote a paper. Chinese needs a strategic depth in the sea. And he claimed 300 kilometers, square kilometers sea as a strategic depth at, depth at sea. That includes Yellow Sea. East China Sea and South China Sea. And it can never be under the international law. But Ambassador Lili of the United States, he taught me when I was serving in the US as political minister, he just retired. He said, Kanihara san, don't take this lightly because they are serious. They understand that this is a, like a land. They call the sea blue land. And they see easy and continental shelf as their territory, mass lands, just like they fend off nomads, Manchus, Mongols, they need deep strategic depth at sea. So they, are, they must take Senkaku, they must take Taiwan, and they must take Ireland in the South China Sea. He said that 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and he, he passed away, but he was so right. And this, this direction will not change easily. And I have said, industrialization, they are successful. Nation state struggling. That's the reason why they are so fearful of splitting minorities like Taiwanese, Uyghurs, Tibetans. Third, industrial democracy must come. But China is not there. They don't share the liberal history with us. They don't share 100 years of the change of the world for liberalism. They don't share that. That means we have to cope with China for maybe coming two, three decades. This is a very long time competition and they are so big. Of course, we have to prepare for militarily too, but we have to make an ally the, the alignment of the Western powers. China is 16% of world GNP today. With India plus Europe, Japan and the United States, we go beyond half, 50%. That means China will not be a global hegemon. China will be only a China, uh, the Asian hegemon. But that means globally, if we cooperate, we can still frame Chinese behavior. And we have to do that for the coming two decades, three decades. The biggest risk is Taiwan. And we have to be prepared. If we lose Taiwan, there will be no credibility of the West. And if we are divided, Lastly, Japan could surrender. If Japan surrenders, whole Asia will surrender to China, and there will be truly an Asian hegemon. That's the reason why we have to be cooperating. Thank you very much. I, I talk too much, maybe. <laughs> no, 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 but that was that was fantastic, really. I, 
and I knew that I could rely upon you to really challenge our sort of uh, our, our sort of uh, our sense of uh, geography and 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 be able to reposition uh, Taiwan in the region in in such interesting and, and creative ways. Um, and uh, and I think that really helps to uh, understand really some of the uh, the role and um, uh, geostrategic value uh, that 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 Taiwan has. And, um, and and now that I think you know we are increasingly well, the world is becoming more increasingly aware of those of those of those values. Uh, it's nonetheless um, you know I think a challenge that Taiwan uh, continually faces uh, in regards to. Um, you know, in, in regards to dealing with with China, I think Taiwan has long recognized the the threat that the PRC posed, and um, and, and we are uh, and and now that we're having this conversation, where I think with with uh, experts from across the world and across the region, um, you know, uh, really sort of I think you know uh, I would say you know sort of having a a pretty a, a shared view of the of the threat picture of, of the challenge that China poses is is uh, is um, you know it's sort of uh, Catch it up with 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 what Taiwan has uh, has has long seen as a um, as as one of the, the the key threats to regional stability and security. Um, next, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, to John Lee, uh, who will uh, give us uh, his views on um, on Australia's uh, uh, perspectives and position in the uh, Indo Pacific. John, thank you, Russell, and I really appreciate the uh, invitation. You know, I've been stuck in Australia since February, and it's a good place to be, but it's really uh, nice to see faces of friends from halfway around the world because it can get quite quite lonely down here. Um, Russell asked me to talk about uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific and, and Taiwan and some of the Australian views. And look, I, I think all four of the Quad countries uh, have their own variation of the FOIP. But in reality, the Australian version is not that different from the American, Japanese, and even the Indian versions uh, when it comes to principles, rule of law, freedom of co from coercion, equal rights, uh, privileges for all states, regardless of size and power, and so on. Um, more recently in Australia, the focus has shifted from stating what our principles with the free and open Indo-Pacific are um, to three things, how we shape the strategic environment, uh, how we deter actions against our interests, uh, and how we demonstrate willingness and capacity to respond with credible military force. Um, so I would say that this harder edge, and you saw that in the uh, 2020 Strategic Defence Update, which was released a couple of months ago by Canberra, this harder edge is where I think the United States, uh, Japan, and Australia are all at uh, currently. Uh, the point of difference at the moment is really where our respective geographical uh, responsibilities lie. So for Australia, it is the Pacific or the South Pacific first and foremost, uh, followed by Southeast Asia. Uh, more recently, we have spoken about longer range cap <coughs> excuse me, capabilities, uh, which would make us more relevant uh, in Northeast Asia, but that's quite a few years away. Now, when it comes to the free and open Indo-Pacific, it can sometimes feel like we are uh, preaching to the choir, right? I mean, we might ask what's not to like about the FOIP, um, but I, I, I wanna raise a conversation I had when I was still in the Australian government with a very senior uh, Indonesian official. And this conversation struck me and I've heard variations of it uh, in my travels, uh, particularly through Southeast Asia. And the comment is this, we know what China's Belt and Road Initiative is all about, but the BRI is a more meaningful and attractive brand to many of us than the FOIP. You know, now that's an extraordinary thing to say, that the BRI is a more meaningful and attractive brand to us than the FOIP. Now, I think this is important. So in, in I wanna spend a few minutes drawing out why, despite all we know about Chinese menace and uh, arrogance, uh, there are still uh, governments and influential people in the region that still hold this view. Now, China's use of coercion in all its forms, military, economic, diplomatic, even personal, uh, is well known. But if China only relied on coercion 
then I think you'd have a long list of countries joining with particularly the Quad countries to balance China. I think it's fair to say that with China, it's not just about coercion and it's not just about economic seduction either, which is the other obvious carrot they have. So consider some key Chinese messages uh, to smaller countries in the region. I've been in a room and have heard this, and I've seen this in action in government, uh, which is very different to what Beijing says to the Quad countries. Now, to Southeast Asia in particular, there is uh, increased and explicit Chinese emphasis, emphasis on the greatness of the Chinese civilization as the enduring basis for a hierarchical, a hierarchical but stable and benevolent relationship with smaller states. Now, let me link this to the BRI. Uh, to Southeast Asians and even to Pacific Island nations, you know, what's interesting is that Beijing is actually not apologetic that the BRI is China-centric. It denies that to us, but it's actually not apologetic to these smaller countries. And it's not even apologetic that uh, China will be the primary beneficiary of the BRI. Uh, in selling the virtues of a hierarchical Chinese-centric order, the main draw card that Beijing has is the guarantee of benefits to smaller states. And it will contrast this to the uh, FOIP, the Liberals Rules-Based Order, which really only provides the rules of fair competition. So whereas the rules of the FOIP will create winners and losers based on merit, fair competition, market principles and so on, the Chinese system will guarantee that benefits will come to all states who embrace the Sinocentric order. So this is why China very deliberately describes Chinese investment and trade with these countries as largesse. It speaks very dismissively of the impersonal market forces uh, that drive American, Japanese and Australian principles. So the point that China is making is this, that only by submitting to this Sinocentric order uh, can you secure this largesse for yourself. And I've got to say it, it works, uh, especially in countries with regimes or, and governments seeking immediate affirmation or evidence that they are delivering outcomes for the economy. Uh, many of these governments are actually proud of being named as essential nodes in one of the BRI six economic corridors. Uh, in contrast, uh, many of them will say, well, we can't point to any immediate gains in openly supporting the principles of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, of course, all of these countries aren't stupid. They are well aware that there is a dark side to being dependent on Chinese largesse. However, the point is that the cost benefit calculation they make means that the smaller states will seek to hedge uh, rather than balance against China. And Beijing has also convinced much of the region that it is fundamentally undeterrable. So there's no point trying. Uh, that the Chinese Communist Party will pay any price to achieve its uh, uh, objectives. So you're better off accepting the largesse on offer rather than uh, getting nothing uh, in the long term. Now, for, for these reasons, I think the only genuine balances uh, in the region are the United States, Japan, Australia, increasingly India, Vietnam, and of course, Taiwan. So let me spend a couple of minutes uh, going on to Taiwan from an Australian perspective. Now, pretty much every country or every almost every country in the region has had their version of one country, two systems. Well, almost every country in the region has a version of one country, two systems when it comes to dealing with the PRC in Taiwan. But I think Beijing has been extremely successful at getting uh, countries to accept Beijing's version of what that actually means. So to give you the Australian example, somehow Australia has got itself into the position where it thinks it needs the PRC's permission to actually sign an economic agreement with Taiwan. Uh, to me, that is a clear ceding of sovereignty. Um, Taiwan is a member of APEC, and besides, uh, nowhere is it stated in the Australian formulation of one country, two systems, that an economic agreement with Taiwan uh, is precluded. Now, I would add that if Beijing can sign a BRI agreement with Victoria, which is one of the six states in Australia, then Australia can sign an economic agreement with Taiwan. 
Now, the obvious concrete step would be to work out with countries like Japan, uh, India, um, well, more Japan in this particular, in this particular case, uh, to help negotiate Taiwan's entry into the CPTPP. Uh, we all know Taiwan's economic and particularly uh, technological base has been hollowed out by the mainland China. Uh, Taiwan is disadvantaged because it only has a meaningful modern trade agreement with the PRC, uh, and it begins at a fundamental disadvantage because it cannot conclude new trade agreements with other countries uh, that, are as, that are comprehensive. It can, but it hasn't. For Taiwan, irrelevance, obviously, or economic irrelevance becomes an existential threat. Uh, but I think, to finish on an optimistic note, I think there are a lot of ducks in alignment uh, which, which favour us. Uh, one, I sense that Taiwan is increasingly flexible on issues which would make trade agreements with other countries more uh, feasible. Uh, two, it comes to the Australian case that applies to other countries. China has always threatened to punish Australia over many issues, including signing a trade agreement with Taiwan. Now, now China is actually threatening Australia, and China has actually carried out economic threats against Australia. My point is that any uh, make that particular decision uh, that Beijing will not like. Uh, the third thing is we now have a very tangible or real view of what one country, two system looks like from mainland China's point of view. Uh, and I think there is genuine regional determination that Taiwan never become like Hong Kong. Uh, finally, all economies, because of the economic coercion piece that China is uh, 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 instigating, all economies are looking to diversify away from China to some extent. And Taiwan is clearly not uh, an insignificant part of that uh, process. Uh, well, Russell, thank you. I think my time is up and, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, John. I think, you know, your, your, your observations about Chinese perceptions of order and, and how that, you know, is it's becoming increasingly clear that the, the, those perceptions and their behaviors are are incompatible with the, the free and open order um, with, has been laid bare. I mean, with, with regards to obviously the, um, uh, the imposition of uh, the draconian laws in, in Hong Kong, and, and, and that's really highlighted, you know, uh, why, you know, Taiwan could never uh, be, well, first of all, why it's never, has been never accepted in Taiwan, um, uh, uh, you know, for, for, as a model for, for unification, but more so that, you know, what that means for the rest of the region as well, uh, in terms of the subjugation of, of, of rights and, and freedom um, as a result of, of China's um, overbearing, overbearing power. Um, and uh, so, so we appreciate that. And I think that your point about realignment, it's, it's been consistent throughout the threads of, of, of the conversation that I'm, I'm hearing from, from the rest of the, of the panelists as well. And I think, you know, I think we'll continue to, to, to pull on that, that, that thread and, and throughout the course of, of, of this panel, as well as um, uh, the, the subsequent panels. Uh, to further discuss this discussion. Um, next, I want to turn it over to Vincent now, who will give us uh, Taiwan's uh, perspectives and priorities with regards to our um, uh, cooperation strategy. Please, Vincent. Okay. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Russell, to join this distinguished panel. And we've already heard from uh, Foreign Minister Wu and Ambassador Shell, so I'll be as brief and concise as I can in my remarks. So since our re-election, President Tsai has laid out a pretty clear vision for a second term, and her focus is on continuing the economic momentum that we've established for a long time. Uh, Taiwan was on the verge of actually dropping out of what has been termed the four Asian tigers. And now, conversely, we're leading the pack, and the stock market is at an all-time high. Salaries are at, at, at a record high, and unemployment is low. So moving forward, uh, we'll continue to see a focus on industrial reform, uh, support for new strategic industries, and being able to stay on top of uh, these trends on uh, supply chain reorganization that we are seeing and which have been prompted by developments in the U.S.-China trade uh, conflict as well as uh, the COVID pandemic. So um, that's one of her focus. Another focus that uh, she's laid out um, is on national defense. And for the first uh, for the past two decades, no president has contributed more on Taiwan's defense than President Tsai has. And I'm really referring to facts here when I say that we've seen historical increases in the defense budget 
Uh, next year, defense spending as a percentage of GDP will reach 2.3%, and that is excluding this additional funding that is part of the F-16 special budget. And if we include that, that would actually bring it closer to 2.4%. Um, the overall defense concept is a concept that was started under her administration and is guiding our defense strategy, which replaces outdated defense uh, doctrines we saw in the past, and we should see more of ODC uh, manifested as additional equipment becomes uh, unveiled. Now, the president also uh, spoke about uh, defense in her inaugural uh, address. Uh, she pledged to focus on asymmetric capabilities, cyber warfare, cognitive warfare, uh, reserve reform, and better management systems for our military personnel. So I know there has been a lot of discussion here in DC about the right way forward on defense. And um, I think the, the, the way she, the president has laid it out, all of this has been helpful as we think about these things moving forward. And the president, you know, she personally is very committed to moving forward in terms of the right um, sort of strategic defense uh, equipment and capability development and reserve systems that we need uh, for Taiwan's effective defense. Uh, the president has also spoken pretty clearly about active international participation. Um, she said in her inaugural address, for example, that uh, a focus would be uh, uh, being able to be part of international organizations, to strengthen relationships with our diplomatic allies, and to enhance ties with like-minded countries, such as the United States, Japan, and European countries, and others. So soon after her remarks, we've seen a number of unprecedented visits to Taiwan from the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the president of the Czech Senate and so forth. So this economic security and international space spheres, they form the basis really of ensuring Taiwan's continued security in the face of PRC aggression mm -hmm. and to provide a very broad foundation for our work going forward. And so building on the president's priorities, I wanna quickly lay out three areas of regional and global cooperation that have been focuses of ours and our priorities were engaged in here in Washington DC and in other capitals around the world. Uh, the first is trade. So Taiwan security is premised on more than just the missiles we have or the number of our men and women uniform. It's just as importantly based on our economic strength, which directly correlates to how much we can afford to spend on defense. So ensuring Taiwan's economic vibrancy is very important to us. While we have been able to maintain relatively strong GDP growth as a country that is very much reliant on external trade, the long-term trends of countries engaging in bilateral and multilateral trading frameworks uh, continue to be challenging for us, very challenging in fact, because Taiwan is on the verge of being left out of all of these. So uh, what we're engaged in here in Washington DC is trying to build the right conditions to engage in FTA with uh, the United States. The president's courageous announcement on market access for pork and beef, which came at tremendous domestic political costs, is consistent with this overall strategy, which is to remove the long-standing obstacles we have to closer economic and trade relations with the US. Uh, after her announcement, we saw Vice President Pence, Secretary Pompeo, and many other important officials come out to essentially echo that sentiment. Uh, Congress, as you know, is also very engaged on this issue, both in the House and the Senate. And uh, we've also been pleased that the U.S. has announced um, that Under Secretary of State Keith Kroc will be leading a new di uh, economic dialogue with uh, Taiwan. So we're building this uh, momentum and hopefully we're creating uh, the right sort of conditions to move forward in terms of closer economic ties with the U.S. But while the U.S. is our second largest trading partner, trade is not just a focus of ours here in D.C. In CPP, TPP countries, our representative offices are also working hard to overcome the significant political interests that would be against Taiwan's participation. We're also intently looking into possibilities for bilateral trade investment agreements with other countries in the Indo-Pacific region. But I will say that much of this will be dependent on what we can accomplish with the U.S., given the concerns that many countries will have towards these uh, significant interests political interests I talked about earlier. So, I mean, I think many countries will look to the U.S. as setting a good example and leading the way in terms of having um, a trade agreement with, the, with Taiwan. The second area of regional global cooperation is strategic. We believe it's very important for countries to recognize and appreciate the importance of Taiwan security, not only for the region, but for the broader dem democratic community. And the long-term trends here are working in our favor. So in the U.S., we've seen the recent declassification on the six assurances, which even lays out uh, more clearly the U.S. position on Taiwan. We've seen discussion on strategic clarity that's taking place. And I want to refer uh, to one of the subtitles in Assistant Secretary Stilwell's remarks at Heritage last month, which was, uh, quote unquote, longstanding strategic clarity. While the U.S. continues to take the lead on so many of these issues, we're also engaged with other members of the international community as well. We've seen greater recognition in Europe, for example, 
uh, which has been um, a highlight of countries and political bodies that are showing greater awareness of Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis China's intentions towards the region and the world uh, at large. The PRC reaction to the Czech president of the Senate uh, visiting has galvanized this and shown, as they often do, that the Chinese really are their own worst enemy. And in uh, Japan, Australia, Canada, and many other democratic countries, there is in increasing discussion about the important role Taiwan plays in ensuring regional stability and keeping a check on China's military intentions. The third area we have been engaged on is international space. Um, the WHO's decision to ex again exclude Taiwan from its annual assembly this year has really highlighted in injustices of its system, particularly in light of Taiwan's COVID successes. So we're seeing unprecedented momentum uh, this year uh, and support that has been articulated uh, by a number of like-minded countries for Taiwan's international participation. And this is extended not just to the WHO, but to other international bodies as well. So over the past year, the U.S. has really played an instrumental role in rallying these like-minded countries together. So we'll have to closely watch and see how the Trump administration's decision to withdraw from the WHO means in terms of rallying countries to support Taiwan. Now, um, our dip diplomatic relations are also important uh, to our international space, and we've been working to find opportunities to jointly engage uh, with other like-minded partners in the support and development of our allies. Um, here in the U.S., we work with the Development Finance Corporation, DFC, for joint projects in Paraguay. We've held GCTF sessions in Palau together with Australia. Uh, we've held a sessions in Guatemala. Um, now we're putting together a partnership opportunity delegations, so which is really a joint investment delegations together with the State Department to countries like St. Lucia. So all of this isn't to say that our diplomatic relations aren't relationships aren't strong in their own right, but we will always look for opportunities to move this relationship forward in a multilateral context, not only with the U.S. but Australia and other stakeholders as well. So I'll end by saying this: Taiwan really has a full slate when it comes to our regional and global engagements. I think we're always pretty envious when we look at other countries that don't face the same challenges we do and are able to conduct diplomacy at a level that is detached from their own country's survival. So we don't have a luxury of doing this. And I know that Ambassador Xiao, she's been here about two months. Uh, we've put together a really full schedule for her. And I know that she and all of us here are driven by a sense of purpose, which is to ensure that Taiwan remains safe, secure, and internationally vibrant, even in face of all the challenges the PRC represents. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Um, excellent. Uh, I think you know the emphasis of your remarks are, are very well placed. As much as our conversation right now uh, and this panel is about global cooperation and strategy, and I purposely, obviously, wanted to assemble experts who have you know uh, country-specific expertise as well as regional expertise. But nevertheless, I think you know center uh, you know the 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 foundation for this global partnership still centers uh, at the heart of it uh, the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. And uh, and really, you I think U.S. leadership is is absolutely key uh, here um, on 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 these issues that we've uh, you've outlined and and, and much more. Um, I want to remind our audience members uh, that uh, we will be taking questions uh, from the audience. I note that we are already starting to receive several uh, questions from um, uh, from the viewers, uh, and you may do so by submitting your questions to contact at globaltaiwan.org. Uh, or um, also um, uh, using the YouTube function um, on the on the website, as well as tweeting us at uh, at Global uh, Taiwan. So I'd like to move over now to the moderated discussion. We'll have a quick moderated discussion for about 12 minutes, and then we'll we'll open it up to Q and A. Um, the first question I wanted to ask is, um, you know, I, I, both the foreign minister's remarks as well as Ambassador Xiao. Um, have noted the importance of, of, of democracies working closer together. This includes, of course, President Tsai as well. Uh, in a recent major policy speech uh, that's gotten a lot of talk, uh, especially in Washington, D.C., is the Secretary of State Pompeo's remarks where uh, he, he gave in California, um, I think at the Nixon Center there, and where he, uh, he suggested the need, and I quote, for a new grouping of like-minded nation, a new alliance of democracies, end quote. And um, I wanted to get your take, um, you know, uh, all, I want all the, the panelists to, to weigh in on this one. Um, you know, this is an idea that hasn't, you know, that's been tried before where it floated around um, and um, for whatever reason, it hasn't 
really sailed. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, this is now surfacing back up again. And I wanted to get, um, you know, this expert panel's views uh, about uh, the feasibility of, of, of a new alliance of democracies. Um, uh, perhaps, Randy, maybe you want to you want to start and kick this off. <clears throat> sure. Well, you're correct. It's not a, a brand new idea. I think uh, we can go back to the Clinton administration, see the creation of the community of democracies. I remember Senator John McCain ran on a uh, a, a grouping that he was proposing of of democracies. Um, so the real question is, do you make it sort of a permanent standing uh, grouping with membership and, and a robust agenda? Does it become more ad hoc? Uh, I think given the, the uh, challenges that, that China is posing on the free and open order, it's, it's worth pursuing. And again, China's own behavior, their own statements, their own actions are sort of giving us all cover to, to take risks that we might not otherwise Take and by that I mean you know this kind of grouping is surely going to face a lot of pressure and even coercion from China, uh, but I think they're bringing this about themselves because they in fact are taking actions that are uh, binding us together by virtue of our shared interests and values. So I, I think you know to maybe initiate something, uh, it, it can be uh, ad hoc at first, and it can be with a purpose. Some issue could be COVID nineteen, it could be something else, um, but I think increasingly uh, this is really shaping up to be part of the competition the the ideological political aspects of the competition and it makes entirely good sense for democracies to to work together either in an ad hoc fashion or in a, a formal grouping would analysts like to take this question i especially want to get john and, and nobu's well as well as ashley's actually all of you to comment on this sorry sure Mm -hmm. uh, sure, Russell, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on the democracy question. It seems to me it, it's always important to, to always remind ourselves why um, it matters that we're democratic and, and, you know, what it is that we have in common because, because if you want to get together a, a league of democracies or whatever, whatever you want to call it, I mean, you still have to explain a reasoning for it. And, and beyond the sort of obvious things, the sort of moral, you know, the, the moral ethical issues, the human rights issues, um, to ground it in, in something more material, I, I think it's sort of happening when you look at things like um, technology, um, te technology cooperation. You know, why are democracies starting to cooperate on 5G, for example? It's not just because we don't like China. It's because we don't like the way that authoritarian countries like China we don't like what they do with the data, the standards, the personal information, all those sorts of things. So I suppose what I'm trying to get at is um, the, the values matter, but we also have to find practical reasons to, to, to sell why we need a grouping like this. And for me, a, the technological ecosystem um, idea is, I think, a very powerful one. Nobu? Yeah, right, wonderful. Uh, I'm yourself. Okay, go. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, about the four Japan, Japan, Australia, India, United States. We are talking about strategic balance, and the, the this is the framework. It's quite. It's now coming to reality. We're very happy to see that, simply because these are the military and economic powers in Asia. But I have to say, to engage Southeast Asians, we have to make more efforts. We don't have NATO here. We don't have EU neither. American Pacific Alliance systems, our system is based upon bilateral alliances. It's much, much weaker than in Europe. We have to make a lot of efforts. I have to say ASEAN nations are, and somehow Korea too, they hate to be involved in big ones' fight. That's their inclination. Oh, keep me in neutrality. Neutral Koreans say when whales fight against each other, shrimps die. That's Korean proverb. They repeat that all the time. And the ASEAN nations feel the same. Even Indonesia, the biggest one, they are beyond the, equal, beyond the equator. And they, they, they say, don't, don't involve us. Vietnamese, Philippines are very close to China. They're bullied every day. 
and they feel something different. Their heart is burning. But say when we say Thailand, Malaysia, they're far away. Malaysia is a coastal of South China Sea, but Thailand is far away. Myanmar, they have they have minorities controlled by China in the mountains. It's very difficult to face China or Myanmar people. We have to get their support. We have to tell them that it's only when we are united, we are in we are in the alignment. We can talk to China on on the equal footing. If we are coordinating one by one into their dark room, we have to surrender one by one. Uh, th this kind of so team th team spirit is not yet there. It's not yet inside Asia. It's not like NATO here. We have to make a lot of efforts. As for the military cooperation, it's much much worse. Japan U.S. alliance was made for Russia. And U.S.-Korea alliance was made for North Korea. And since Nixon went to Beijing, nobody thought of fighting against China. And military operation is just like Olympic game or baseball game. You have to train every day together. Otherwise, you can never fight together. And we are not yet there at all. And we, ha we don't have to provoke Chinese militarily or diplomatically, but we have to be prepared very quietly. Otherwise, the we can't depend upon their goodwill. We have to be in a stable equilibrium with China economically, but also militarily. Otherwise, when they change their way one day, they can push forward the agenda. And I, I, Taiwan is not easy island to take, but we had the same situation in Hokkaido during the Cold War. If we surrender Hokkaido in one week, Americans can defend that. And the Russians will come down to Honshu Islands, maybe occupy Tokyo. I could be shot dead. <laughs> this was the reality during the Cold War. I want the same situation to maintain themselves for uh, several weeks. Otherwise, it will be lost. That's a very heavy burden for them. And somehow we need to think about this seriously. China is a Sun Tzu nation. They are very smart. They're not warriors nation like us or like Russians. <laughs> they are very smart people in the courts. They calculate all the time. They attack, like Sun Tzu says, they attack only when enemy is not prepared. When the enemy is prepared, they don't attack. And in maybe 20 years time, they want to pick out. Like we did, we did, French did. Americans are going up in this way, and India is now coming up in this way. Indian average age is now 23 years old. Amazing, isn't it? We are 49 years old. China is 39 years old. The future is Indian hands. So if we can survive until 2050, for example, India will come to rescue us. So until that moment, we have to be, we have to be okay. And then for that purpose, we have to be prepared together very quietly. Otherwise, we'd be lost. Ashley, in your interaction with, with Indian counterparts and senior level <laughs> officials, what, what are your views um, with regards to the, this notion of, a, of an alliance of democracies? Well, first, let me say, Kanehara san reminded me of what a dinosaur I am, <laughs> just <laughs> compared to where yes. India is yes. and will be for the next uh, for the next several years. But but two points in that regard. I think there is a great value in finding new ways for democracies to demonstrate solidarity uh, through their cooperation in the international system. Because if for no other reason. What it does is that it, it provides a vision of what the alternative is uh, to the kind of regime that China has. So one doesn't want to underestimate it, but I would also caution against overestimating its effects, because to my mind, at least for the next two decades, the Chinese challenge is going to be so substantial that we will have to look for ways to cooperate even with countries that are not perfect democracies uh, in order to be able to balance its rise. And so for democracies, uh, the question really is, how does one use the mechanism, uh, not a principled argument about you know, the validity of the mechanism, 
Uh, and I think the if I understand the Indian debate, that's pretty much where it is. I mean, India is very proud of its own democratic tradition and the fact that it's actually survived as a democracy for, for 70 odd years. But the question is, how much stock do you place on the democratic dimension as opposed to, say, other dimensions of national power when dealing with the Chinese threat? I suspect this is going to be a debate actually within all uh, democratic countries, uh, you know, in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you all for, Thank those, you all. for those responses. I, I, um, I want to get to the question of the Pacific Islands because I did mention this at the outset when Randy spoke, and, and I, I do want I do think that this is a a region where there's a lot of uh, interconnection there with with Australia and, and Japan, especially, and, and, and to some extent maybe even India. Um, although I'm not entirely clear as, as to that angle of it, but I, I do want to get to the Pacific Island and see where. Where, where, where you, you know, where the experts here can um, sort of shed some light as to really where there there are potentials to uh, for further U.S. Taiwan and, and global cooperation in, in that region. I mean, Taiwan has lost two diplomatic partners there in that region in, in, in recent years, and and certainly that's uh, it's a and there are you know it's one of the the clusters where there are you know where Taiwan's remain diplomatic partners, one of the major clusters where they remain, and um, so. I really want to get everyone's uh, take on on the Pacific Islands before we move to audience Q and A. Um, okay, uh, Nobu, you want to go first? Okay, go for it. Yeah, we start to talk about this with Canberra and with Wellington maybe two three years ago because we found Chinese everywhere, and we picked we picked up the island nations that were taken by China, Vanuatu, Solomon, these things, and we agreed with the Canberra, for example. This is exactly what Japanese Imperial Navy did. They picked up Micronesia. They are trying to take over Palau. And they went down to, say, Papua New Guinea, and then Solomon, Vanuatu, Fiji, Samoa. This is Japanese Imperial Naval Strategy. And they are just following that. And our I never and I say that this is not copying the Imperial Strategy of Japan. If you think the locations of these islands, it's evident that what islands are important. And we are trying to do that simply because we want to cut off Americans from Australia. Australian troops are already in Middle East and, the, and in Europe to, in the, to help Churchill. But it's empty. The MacArthur fled there. We want to cut off Americans from Australia. That's what we did. China is doing exactly the same thing. And we started to talk about our islands. Say, Palau is very close to Taiwan. It's on the other side of the Philippines, and it's, it recognizes Taiwan. Micronesia was taken by China, and now the new president is very close to the West. We are very lucky. Marshall is okay to the American bases there. Melanesia, that's Australian, Australian responsibility, and they are spending 10 more times more money than us to help islanders in Melanesia. And Polynesia, that's Wellington's sphere of influence, it's weak. China is everywhere. And Fiji is now coming back to us. We're lucky. Tonga, that king, is now in their hands. And we have to tell the Pacific Islanders, we are here. And it's not competition for money, because they have a huge amount of money. But we can tell them, China is not only your option, you have other options. And our, our strategy is comprehensive, from fishery to, to drug, you know, policing against drug dealers and customs and the environment and everything, climate change, we can go to them because it's there, there. It's just like villages, tiny islands. So we, we, we have to say that we are, we are other options and we can incorporate you into our Pacific free trade zones and Pacific prosperity. That's what we have to do. I think we are cooperating very closely, Wellington, Canberra, Tokyo. We're very happy to share this experience with Indian Ocean Islands, Cook Islands, these things. We have no true, Japan has no experience there. And we need, we need the Indian injection here. Andaman Nicobar, we know, of course, we fought against the, against the British. <laughs> but beyond that, beyond Sri Lanka, we don't know very much. And we need the Indian injection of wisdom. We're happy to cooperate with India for the islands. Yep. 
Uh, there you go. You well, got Russell, uh, not surprisingly, I agree with Kanaharo Song completely. Um, so not to repeat everything he said, but just to add to it a little bit. Uh, I do think we have special responsibilities in Micronesia, and the, the most important thing we could do would be to extend the financial aspects of the uh, Compacts of Free Association. That's that's widely supported, but we need to get it across the finish line. But the, the two additions I would make to uh, Kanahara-san's comments, I think this division of labor concept, Micronesia, and then Australia takes care of Melanesia, Wellington takes care of Polynesia, uh, I think we need to to uh, augment that a little bit to understand that there are certain cases where all hands are on deck are required and that we need to step up our game across the whole in, entire Pacific. And that's where Japan can play a special role because you don't sort of have this uh, uh, legacy of responsibility with one portion of the, the South Pacific. You, you can uh, assist us in, in having broader reach. The, the other addition I would make is, in, a, in, a, in addition to India perhaps being more uh, active, uh, the French have very special interests here. Um, I had an opportunity to visit New Caledonia when I was assistant secretary. Obviously, they, they have the second largest EEZ in the world because they are a Pacific nation. They do have four deployed forces in New Caledonia and in the, in the uh, Tahiti area. Uh, but they, they take a special interest as well in, in certain cases. And, and for example, I think in, in Vanuatu, when there were all these press stories about the, the Chinese money buying undue influence there and corrupting the uh, political system there, the, the French came in very quickly with reassurances and, and exposure of the Chinese plan. They can also be helpful on the counter piracy piece and on the anti-trafficking piece. So. Uh, again, all hands on deck rather than uh, a strict division of labor and in thinking creatively about the contributions of other countries is really important. Okay. Um, well, hey, um, let me just add on to some of uh, which had been covered already, but I completely agree with uh, Kanahara's comment that the Chinese are everywhere in the Pacific. And if you look, if you go anywhere to any of uh, these uh, small island states, you, you'll see these battlefields and these memorials in this, uh, for the Second World War, and you see these graves, and, and really they show the amount of blood that was shed for each one. And we know that this blood was not shed for no purpose. It's because these islands do hold enormous strategic interest, but they've been essentially ignored for the past three, four decades by everybody except for Australia and to a certain extent Japan, New Zealand, and us. So it's absolutely essential for us to work together to keep the PRC out of the region. But I also don't want to ignore the countries um, by uh, the countries in their own right. And, and you know, if you go uh, look at these countries, they are proud of being progressive countries. They're proud of being democratic countries. You know, uh, all of these countries across the Pacific, they're, they're, they have a strong uh, democratic tradition despite their size and their proximity from others. And so this Chinese influence that's creeping into the region, it is politically destabilizing. And we look what's happening in Kiribati uh, when, you know, the lack of uh, public discussion over the switch of diplomatic relations essentially, you know, spelled out the next year of extremely destabilizing political actions. And in the Solomon Islands, where their largest province, Malaita province, is now seeking independence. So, you know, there is there is a very valid interest uh, strategically and politically in trying to keep the PRC out of the region. But, you know, it's not enough for us to say, hey, you know, these countries, all of you guys need to look at the big picture, you need to look at strategy, you need to look at politics. You know, these small countries, I think, in some cases, are concerned about more issues that are closer to home, climate change, uh, economic development, you know, social programs, all of this. So I think it's really incumbent to, to, to work together to offer real incentives for these countries to say. So I subscribe completely to what Randy was saying. You really need all hands on deck because every country really australia new zealand us japan we we are we can all contribute differently you know just one tiny example in the solomon islands for example you go from the airport to the main city and that road was built by the japanese and it's the best road in the country it's the only it's the only smooth paved road in the country and so there's actually a lot of a lot of incentive for countries to work together jointly um and i think that's really the only way that we can keep the prc up Um, okay, uh, I do want to get to the audience Q and A, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna start I'm gonna condense some of these questions uh, so that they are a little bit more manageable. Um, the first question here is uh, from um, the Voice of America uh, reporter Tina Chong, and this question is for Randy Shriver and also the other panelists. Um, basically, it's 
is the U.S. or the region prepared for a potential conflict in the Taiwan Strait? Um, and, and I would just add to that a recent piece that was penned by um, you know former senior U.S. intelligence and defense officials, basically warning about a fait accompli uh, and, and uh, facing the United States uh, in the Taiwan Strait. And so uh, maybe getting a reaction from um, um, you know Randy and, and others with regards to the potential for conflict in the Taiwan Strait and whether or not uh, you know we're ready for it. Well, the risks are growing, uh, but remember we have a law that says we must maintain the capacity to resist force if asked to do so by our national command authority. So you start with uh, what Kanahara-san was laying out in terms of the uh, mountainous, inhospitable terrain, the 80 nautical miles of water. That's a pretty good place to start on the defense before you buy a single weapon system. Um, but I, what I'm encouraged by is there's a tremendous amount of focus on this in the defense enterprise now. The broader China challenge, but but also the specific understanding of Taiwan's strategic importance and, and why we need to be able to prepare to prevail in that contingency. And we, we're, we're doing that in terms of uh, realigning our thinking, our posture, what we're investing in. This will take some time, but, I, but I'm very encouraged by the focus. And uh, we do this not because we're, we're itching for a fight. Uh, I certainly don't want to see conflict in the Taiwan Strait. It would be tremendously costly for all parties involved. We do this to strengthen our deterrence and to make the PLA, you know, I, I, I looked at my job as Assistant Secretary of Defense, if I could get up and I, I could be reassured that the PLA was saying, okay, not today. Then they wake up, they say, okay, not this week, not next month, not next year. You know, if we can just extend that timeline uh, and hopefully in perpetuity in the sense of Taiwan's continued survival and success, uh, then we'll be doing our job. Thanks. Uh, John? Uh, the same defense of Randy, Maybe you've heard it, the youth joke that if war broke out in the Taiwan Straits and the United States asked for Australian support, we would send our slowest, smallest ship and hope that the conflict was over by the time we got there. Now, that, that story was, you know, w was around doing the rounds not so long ago, but you won't hear that anymore. And in fact, if you look at the Australian acquisitions program, so we're essentially trying to acquire capabilities that will make us directly relevant to a theatre like the Taiwan Straits. And we're doing that for a couple of reasons. One, there's an understanding of the strategic importance of Taiwan, which I think Randy spoke about in his opening remarks. Um, but two, I think there's also an understanding that um, the more you acquire capabilities to intervene in a uh, meaningful way, uh, in, the less likely Beijing will actually try to um, uh, change, you know, the, the, the status quo of Taiwan. Um, so, so, so I think from the Australian point of view, uh, you know, we won't publicly say it, but um, my personal point of view is that we're, we're, this is seen as something that, if it happens, is also our fight. Now, in keeping with the theme of our, our, of our, of our panel on global cooperation, the next question I want to move, go over to Garrett Vanderwees, who's a GTI advisor. And, uh, and he said, this question is related to Europe. So in Europe, there's been a major shift in support uh, of Taiwan uh, in relation to the Czech visit, uh, the letter in Le Monde and, and Handelsblatt. How can a new US administration coordinate more with Europe in terms of Taiwan? And, I'll and, and perhaps I'll expand that a little bit to include you know, the, other, um, the, the other countries that we uh, uh, covered in, in our discussion today. Go ahead. Um, and anyone want to take that one? Uh, okay, double, okay. Um, the Europeans are, they, they see China. Okay, Russia is, is big enough, twice as big as China. We're seeing their backs. And NATO was holding the head. Americans are pointing the nuclear weapons beyond the, the Arctic Sea. That's, that's Russia. But Chinese dragons' tail is so short. And Europeans don't see that. They see only Putin. They say Putin is a problem. But Putin would never attack Estonia. They would never invade NATO. They they uh, they invaded Crimea, but they, it's inside Russia's sphere of influence. They're sensitive to that. Russia, the Belarus, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Europeans are upset by that. And I have to say to bring Europeans in Asia, their attention. We have to make much more efforts. I have to say Hong Kong is British colony. And UK is sensitive to that. Taiwan is not seen by them. 
and we have to make them understand that if we lose Taiwan, that's Taiwan in EU is the size of Romania, number seventh nation in terms of population in in EU. In terms of economy, it's a huge economy in, in Europe. It's a huge entity, and they don't see that. We have to make them understand the importance of Taiwan to the Europeans first, British, second, French, because they understand Asian affairs. Germany is number one country in now EU, but their view is limited like us. They are defeated in the Pacific War. They are framed by NATO. Their strategic thinking did not go beyond NATO. Recently, they started to think about Asia-Pacific region. It's a very good advance in the German diplomacy. We have to engage Germany. We have to engage big ones, Spanish, Italians, Poles, uh, it's not, it, they are true Europeans, and we have to gather the, all the European nations through Brussels. And Chinese tactics is to grab the small ones one by one in this way. In Europe case, it's Hungary and the Eastern, Southeastern European nations. That's Chinese tactics. What they do in here in Asia, they do in Cambodia, they do that in Laos, they do that in, even in Brunei. And we have to take back these smaller nations. We have to pay attention to them. They're very proud sovereign nations. So we have to attend to the, all the nations in Europe and make them understand Asian situation, in particular Taiwan's importance. We have to make efforts. You know, since we're, we are running out of time, I, I, I unfortunately, I do, I, I do want to wrap up here. Uh, and I want to close with a question that ties back to Randy's closing comment, uh, and this is a question from from our, our, our advisory board member Joe Bosco, uh, and this was addressed specifically to Randy. And he said in a Fox interview, President Trump stated emphatically that China knows what the United States will do if it attacks Taiwan. Wouldn't it be useful and appropriate for the U.S. to state its position publicly so the American know where U.S. policy is heading and can support it intelligently? I think. Maybe a, a declaratory statement, perhaps, of U.S. strategic clarity on Taiwan. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I'm in favor of, of greater strategic clarity. But I think if you're, if you're sitting in Beijing, you, you got to think about a few things. There's never been a, a dust up of any sort or a crisis of any sort that the U.S. didn't come to Taiwan's assistance in some capacity. In some capacity, right? Whether that's the, the logistic support provided in 58, 59 during the island shelling, whether that's 96, the, the deployment of two aircraft carriers to the area. Um, and if there were a, a conflict or, or military coercion in the future, the United States has a lot of options. You know, it's not only flowing tens of thousands of troops or a division onto the island of Taiwan. We can do things that are that are a little bit more passive, ISR support, intelligence support. We can do things that are a little more visible, but non kinetic logistic support, dealing with uh, the PLA zone, ISR complicating that. We can do things that are uh, division of labor and, and involve kinetics where we have comparative advantages like the use of our submarines. So as I've said before, I, I think it's a huge risk if you sit in Beijing and you think America won't have the stomach, won't have the will, um, given our track record, how, how, do, how are they counting on an aberration uh, at this point, given our history and the importance of Taiwan as, as we've all talked about today? So. You know, I, I think strategic clarity and the tactical ambiguity, what we would actually do in a crisis is the right formula. Well, thank you all very much for that terrific and insightful opening discussion. Uh, I mean, we really could go on uh, the entire day, really, just to, to cover all the grounds that we just briefly touched on. I really hope to have you all of you back again for another discussion on this uh, on these issues. Uh, normally, at this point, I would ask the audience to give you all a round of applause, uh, but my heartfelt thanks to all of you will have to do for now. Um, so thank you all. And uh, as an administrative note uh, for our audience members, uh, please hold for a few minutes as we uh, transition to the next panel on um, political trends and cross relations. Thank you.
that's the that's more provided in the time during the a conflict or military coercion in the future. The United States has a lot of options. You know, it's not only following tens of thousands of troops or division onto the island of Taiwan. We do things that are that are a little bit more passive. ISR support does more more physical but not kinetic. Existing support dealing with PLA zone ISR public Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to panel two of GTI's annual symposium. Uh, my name is Jennifer Chang, a research fellow at GTI, and I'm delighted to moderate this panel, which explores political trends in Taiwan and the current state of cross-strait relations. Um, we are currently in a very interesting time in U.S.-Taiwan-China relations. Uh, the U.S.-China bilateral relationship the most consequential major power relationship in the world is at a historical low point. Um, there's also a long list of issues currently testing this bilateral relationship. Two such issues that will be discussed in this panel are the strengthening of US-Taiwan relations, which stand better than ever in recent memory, and also Chinese moves to strip Hong Kong of its autonomy, uh, rendering the one country, two systems governance model into more of a theoretical concept than objective reality. Um, earlier this year, uh, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen was recently reelected for another four years. Many analysts believe that Beijing is stepping up its multifaceted pressure campaign against Tsai's government and will seek to continue to constrain Taipei's efforts to carve out some international space. As Taiwan's main opposition uh, Kuomintang party seeks to boost its domestic political fortunes. It is also turning external support, um, seeking external support from across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, we are currently in the COVID-19 era. Um, as the US has failed to control its rapidly rising infection cases, um, um, Taiwan, um, there are concerns that China has upper hand in demonstrating global leadership on um, pandemic assistance. For Taiwan, its impressive handling of the coronavirus has provided a new arena for bilateral and multilateral cooperation. Uh, Taiwan's willingness to assist other countries experiencing relatively high levels on, of infections and deaths um, has led to um, a new momentum um, in its long running bid to participate in the world Health Organization and the United Nations, um, and we have the General Assembly convening virtually later this month. Uh, we are fortunate to have an esteemed panel of experts who will be addressing these broader themes and delve into other salient issues in Taiwan's domestic politics and cross-strait relations. Uh, our first speaker is Shelley Rigger, who is a Brown Professor of East Asian Politics at Davidson College. She is also a non-resident fellow of the China Policy Institute at Nottingham University and a senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. She is also a director of the Taiwan Fund, um, a closed-ended investment fund specializing in Taiwan-listed companies. She is the author of two books on Taiwan's domestic politics, Politics in Taiwan, Voting for Democracy, um, and from opposition to power, Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party. In 2011, she published Why Taiwan Matters, Small Island Global Powerhouse, a book for general readers. Uh, next, we have uh, J. Michael Cole. Uh, he is a senior uh, fellow, non-resident fellow with GTI um, and is based in Taipei. Um, he is a... Um, a senior fellow with the McDonnell Laurel Institute in Ottawa, Canada, and a senior non-resident fellow with the Taiwan Studies Program at the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom, and research associate with the French Center for Research on Contemporary China. From 2014 to 2016, he worked at Thinking Taiwan Foundation and was the chief editor of Thinking Taiwan, 
His two latest books, both published in 2020, are Cross Strait Relations Since 2016, The End of the Illusion, and Insidious Power How China Undermines Global Democracy, both published in 2020. Um, next, we have Bonnie Glazier, who is a senior advisor for Asia and the director of the China Power Project at CSIS. Um, Um, she is also a non-resident fellow with the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia, and a senior associate with the Pacific Forum. From 2018 to mid-2015, she was a senior advisor with the CSIS Freeman Chair in China Studies. And from 2003 to 2008, she was a senior associate in the CSIS International Security Program. Prior to joining CSIS, she served as a consultant for various U.S. government offices, including the Departments of Defense and State. Next, we will hear from Ambassador Stephen Young, who is a member of GTI's advisory board. He served as a U.S. diplomat uh, for over 33 years with assignments in Washington, Taipei, Moscow, Beijing, Kyrgyzstan, and Hong Kong. He was ambassador to the Kyrgyz Republic Director of the American Institute in Taiwan and Consul General to Hong Kong. Since returning to his family home in New Hampshire in 2013, Young has been writing and speaking. Um, our last speaker is Richard C. Bush III, who is a non-resident senior fellow in the Center for East Asian Policy Studies and served as, as its director from 2002 to 2018 at the Brookings Institution. He previously held the Chen Fu and Cecilia Yang Ku Chair in Taiwan Studies at Brookings. From 1997 to 2002, he was Chairman and Managing Director of the American Institute in Taiwan. His latest book, Difficult Choices, Taiwan's Quest for Security and the Good Life will be published early next year. Um, seems that we have lost um, Bonnie Glazier, um, but maybe she'll join us later. Um, so um, each panelist will provide a 10 minute opening remark, uh, followed by a moderated discussion and Q&A. Uh, we'll invite our virtual audience members to submit questions for our panelists throughout the duration of this panel. And questions can be sent through the chat function on our YouTube page or by email to contact at globaltaiwan.org. Um, and we'll first hear from Shelley Ricker, who will discuss Taiwan's domestic political trends and its implications for cross-strait relations. All right, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's really an impressive lineup of speakers that you have for today and tomorrow. And I am really honored to be among them. Jennifer, you look a little anxious. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so 2019-2020, about the last 18 months, have been among the most eventful periods in Taiwan's domestic politics that I can remember. Um, certainly the era of active democratic transition was more eventful in the sense that we had a first of everything year upon year upon year. Uh, but the last 18 months have really blown my mind in terms of the velocity of activity and change in Taiwan's domestic political scene. For a long time, I've been someone who tends to encourage uh, the, the view that there is a kind of stability underlying the political changes month on month, year on year in Taiwan. So I've sometimes used the metaphor of there's a lot of froth on the water. There's always a lot of white cats on the ocean when you're talking about Taiwan, but the, that the deep currents are relatively consistent over time. And the changes of the last 18 months have caused me to reconsider that metaphor. I probably should have reconsidered that metaphor a long time ago because it's probably terrible. But um, anyway, it seems to me that the currents are shifting um, and that potentially we may be reaching a real inflection point with Taiwan, especially domestic politics and public opinion, in which uh, some of the established patterns within the island may begin 
to move in really marked ways. And the most obvious example of that, if you've checked the uh, graphs, the ubiquitous graphs on the Election Studies Center at National Junction University, you see that in the, in the last two surveys, um, including May of 2020, there is this really strong upward trend in two things. One, the percentage of Taiwanese identifying as Taiwanese only, so rejecting not only a Chinese identity, but also a dual Chinese Taiwanese identity. And there's been an increase in the percentage of Taiwanese uh, showing support for independence. And I think these two trends are probably not sustainable at the current level. I think that they may uh, slow down or level off a bit, but that they are significant and durable and they show that things are changing. The shift has been coming for a while. I think it started in the Mayingzhou era where after many years of the focus being on kind of calibrating Taiwan's involvement in the mainland, certain policy changes that seemed very natural and almost inevitable at the time relating to extending agreements for cross-strait economic cooperation from the direction of Taiwan to China, extending those to the direction of from the mainland to Taiwan, mainly investment, but then also the cross straits uh, services trade agreement, also um, bringing services in the other direction. Um, I think that shift, when people in Taiwan began to realize that we're no longer just talking about how much should Taiwanese be doing in China, we're also talking about how much should people from the PRC and entities from the PRC be doing in Taiwan, that really reoriented the way a lot of Taiwanese viewed the political conversation that they were having. And one way to think about it is they went from trying to make sure that Taiwan wasn't overly inv invested in the mainland to freaking out that Chinese were going to become overly invested in Taiwan. So I think that, you know, even the 2016 election reflects this sort of sea change in emphasis. Uh, but nonetheless, 18 months ago, um, certainly two years ago, uh, Tsai Ing-wen was really struggling with her popularity and her uh, the sort of volume of political capital that she had available to her to do the things that the administration wanted and needed to do. Um, she was being pressured to maintain a stable balance with Prostrate relations. So, um, not do anything that would cause unnecessary deterioration in prostrate relations and keep the uh, the relationship on as even a, a footing as possible. And there was even in 2018, certainly as we saw from the local elections that year, an an audience for a sort of KMT style, higher, more engagement focused prostrate policy. And then 2019 hit. It started with Xi Jinping's pretty bellicose speech, or at least a speech that was heard in Taiwan as pretty bellicose, and with Tsai Ing-wen's in instant, near instantaneous and very strong response. So the year started with this kind of jolt that something's changed here on the PRC side, and our president, Tsai Ing-wen, has stood up very strongly to that challenge. Nonetheless, uh, people didn't catch on right away that uh, things were changing as much as they were. So we saw a lot of criticism of Tsai Ing-wen, including from within the DPP early in 2019. Then comes the uh, Hong Kong crisis. And so for about a year, um, Taiwanese were watching as uh, the situation in Hong Kong deteriorated further and further and further. Uh, Hong Kong people stood up to pressure from their own leadership, which was allied with uh, Beijing in really unexpected and unprecedented ways. And I think this both energized a lot of people in Taiwan, especially young people, 
but also sobered a lot of people, the realization that uh, things can get really, really bad in a hurry. Then you have the collapse of the Hangwayu phenomenon, which we can talk about later if you want to. I suspect most of the people on this call have heard so much about Hangwayu that they are over Hangwayu. But if you're not, you know, um, we can talk about him some later. But then that, you know, the, the sort of culminating point seemed to be the election in January of 2020, where uh, Tsai Ing-wen won a very decisive victory, both uh, and her party, uh, a pretty decisive victory, certainly regaining uh, control of the leg or retaining control of the legislature and of the executive. But that wasn't the end of the uh, roller coaster, or it's really sort of a one way roller coaster. So far, we're still on the downslope of the 2019 2020 moment. Um, immediately after the election, our attention was riveted. And I was in Taiwan at that time. Um, so it was very clear how fast attention pivoted from the election to COVID. And I think the, uh, and I'm working on some research now trying to get a little money to put together a survey to really find out how COVID has affected uh, Taiwanese public opinion. But it sure looks to me like uh, the COVID crisis has only reinforced the perception that um, bad things come from the mainland and that Taiwan was lucky that the mainland withdrew its uh, tourists and so on when they did, uh, because that helped Taiwan to protect itself effectively from COVID. So at this point, the PRC is in such bad odor in Taiwan that even the KMT is retreating from its past positions about um, on cross-strait relations. Others are going to talk about U.S.-Taiwan relations, but on the domestic side, there are two things that feel really new to me that I just want to mention. First of all, um, the fact that Tsai Ing-wen spent the political capital uh, to get a breakthrough on economic ties with the U.S., which is to say she took an spectacularly unpopular action, allowing the uh, well, setting the standard for ractopamine that would allow the importation of American pork and beef. This is super unpopular in her with her domestic audiences, but she did it because she wants to solidify the relationship with the U.S. And she believes, I think, that she can get a, an economic deal from Washington. All I can say to that is the U.S. side better not let her down because she has paid a big political cost for this opportunity. And then the second thing, uh, just to kind of follow up on something that was mentioned in the previous panel, I see Tsai Ing-wen in photographs with the military all the time now. Uh, she's really clearly paying a lot more attention to uh, preparing the Taiwanese people for the need to take seriously that issue of national defense. And the one last point, I know I'm out of time, most of this change, it, the cause, the causal driver for most of this change is changes in the behavior of the Beijing government. Nothing's really changing in Taiwan, but what Taiwanese people see is a very different and much more threatening and scary Beijing, China, PRC, and that's what's driving all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shelley, uh, for this overview of the different changes in Taiwan's domestic politics, also in uh, domestic uh, Taiwanese identity and opinion towards China. And I think this is a good way to uh, segue into uh, our discussion on cross-strait relations. So our next speaker will be uh, J. Michael Cole, who would be discussing Beijing's tactics and Taiwan's responses. Good, wonderful. Well, thanks for, for having me. I wish I could be in Washington, but the uh, second year in a row that I miss it. Last year was a typhoon. This year it's COVID-19. Uh, anyway, so good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, building upon what uh, Shelley just said, uh, it's absolutely right. In terms of cross-strait relations, uh, we've seen in the past year or so, you know, mostly continuity in terms of how Beijing has treated Taiwan. Uh, but to that, we have certainly seen an element of escalation as well. And it's all gradual. There hasn't been a major shift uh, in China's approach to uh, to Taiwan. Uh, the same supposed preconditions for uh, improved ties uh, continue to apply in that Beijing insists on uh, Taipei recognizing the 1992 consensus 
uh, and on the Taiwanese side, while the Thai government uh, continues to refuse to do so, uh, largely because of the One China Clause uh, and in Taiwan, uh, increasing association of the 1992 consensus with the one country, two systems, uh, which, which is unpalatable to pretty much everybody in Taiwan, including uh, the KMT itself. Uh, nonetheless, the insistence on the 1992 consensus uh, remains a useful tool to attempt to divide uh, the Taiwanese society. Uh, although uh, it's become quite clear that even for those in the blue camp, uh, including former President Ma, uh, that uh, there are two different uh, interpretations to one China, uh, that charade has pretty much lost a lot of currency uh, and I would say the, the, the main point was uh, Xi Jinping's address to Taiwanese compatriots in January last year. Uh, so we've reached a point where even the KMT has gone on the record saying that uh, one country, two systems is not a viable option or an offer for the Taiwanese. What has mostly made the news uh, in the past year or so in terms of cross threat relations is the military escalation. Uh, we have seen uh, a marked uptick in PLA uh, Air Force, PLA Navy intrusions uh, around Taiwan, near Taiwan, uh, into Taiwan's ADIZ. A uh, number of occasions we have had uh, combat aircraft crossing Taiwan's median line or the median line in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, certainly more publicized exercises in the Taiwan Strait, in the West Pacific, uh, near the Bashi Channel and other areas. So they're becoming more routine and increasingly aggressive as well, uh, not only in terms of the platforms being used, but also the rhetoric that oftentimes accompanies those exercises uh, in state control media uh, and social media in China. Uh, that also has been accompanied by an increase in use of, of disinformation and mostly uh, we assess as a means to exacerbate the psychological effects on the Taiwanese people. Now, whether that is successful or not uh, certainly remains to be to be seen. Uh, all of that also has been accompanied by a decreasingly belligerent uh, ultra-nationalistic tone in China uh, towards Taiwan. Uh, earlier this year, a study demonstrated a worrying uptick in the use of genocidal language uh, on some Chinese social media to refer to Taiwan. And basically, if we translate what was said, it's uh, wipe out the island and only birds will be left. Uh, while that kind of language does not necessarily reflect official CCP policy, um, it can nevertheless contribute to adventurism and it could undermine de-escalation in time of conflict. Uh, there also seems to be a greater frustration and resentment in China uh, over Taiwan's refusal to, to play along. Um, I think a lot of that also stems from the fact that the CCP simply cannot admit to its people uh, that most of its Taiwan policy has been an abject failure uh, in recent years, particularly under, under Xi Jinping. Uh, so I, I expect that uh, much of the propaganda that is being uh, circulated in, in Chinese media, but also the things that Chinese officials are saying, are aimed primarily at a domestic audience in China and not so much at people in Taiwan who are seeing through the rhetoric. Uh, besides military uh, exercises and, and signaling, we have seen continued efforts to attempt to co-opt uh, young entrepreneurs in Taiwan, uh, people working in the media, uh, students, teachers, academics, uh, blue collar, white collar workers, uh, people working in the high tech sector, uh, oftentimes through all expenses paid trips to China. Uh, as well as, as different fora, uh, such as the Straits Forum, uh, that will be held uh, in Xiamen later this week. Uh, those efforts, however, have been undermined by COVID-19, uh, largely due to the fact that travel across the Taiwan Strait has been substantially uh, reduced because of the outbreak. Uh, Beijing's aim remains to divide Taiwan uh, and try to erode the relationship between the central and local governments. Uh, with the I would say the diminished effectiveness of the KMT, and that's certainly something that CCP officials have been complaining about in recent years. Uh, China has increasingly relied on independent candidates, uh, business people, uh, heads of local governments, as well as pro-unification parties like the China Unification Promotion Party, uh, the New Party, and the small uh, Taiwan Red Party. 
We see continued use of CCP media in Taiwan, or pro-CCP media in Taiwan to spread propaganda uh, and disinformation, mostly to undermine not only the Thai administration, but also the appeal of, of democracy uh, with the Taiwanese public. Uh, continued use of content farms, uh, many of which are funded by the Chinese. Some of them are funded or operated by uh, business people in Taiwan, who oftentimes have uh, business operations back in, in China. Uh, and disinformation on Chinese social media as well that tends to uh, recycle uh, official statements uh, by, by Chinese authorities. Uh, we also continue to see the use of different front organizations, uh, China-based research institutes uh, to attract foreign academics, uh, often as visiting scholars, and in return for which they agree to reflect Beijing's line on Taiwan and other territorial disputes such as the South China Sea. Uh, we have seen continued intimidation of global NGOs. The latest victim is a, an NGO that looked after uh, wildlife and made mostly birds, and they are being pressured by the Chinese to remove references to Taiwan and not support uh, supposed Taiwanese independence. Uh, we're seeing, particularly during COVID-19, uh, Chinese officials, diplomats, consulars, uh, pressuring governments not to engage Taiwan, uh, even to refuse medical assistance and masks uh, offered by, by Taiwan at the height of the, of the pandemic. Uh, the wolf warrior diplomats have been quite vocal in a number of countries, uh, threatening uh, local governments, promising retaliation over high-profile visits. Uh, most recently, we saw with the visits of a Czech delegation that came to, to Taiwan for a few days. And more recently, China has also threatened sanctions against any senior American official uh, who visits Taiwan. There will be one later this week, so we will see if China indeed uh, chooses to retaliate. Uh, China also continues to uh, use its growing influence within the UN organizations to ensure Taiwan's exclusion. Uh, that certainly made headlines during COVID-19 with Taiwan's inability to participate in World Health Assembly uh, and meetings at WHO. Uh, China continues to use its influence, or growing influence at UN General Assembly, particularly among developing countries, uh, and are using uh, blow, uh, block voting uh, for the elections of heads of specialized UN agencies. So there's a good number of Chinese individuals who are now running a specialized UN institutions, and more often than not, they will reflect uh, Beijing's official line and position uh, when it comes to Taiwan. So how has the Thai government responded to all this? Well, uh, as uh, as Shelley just said, uh, President Tsai certainly has a very strong mandate following the elections in January. Uh, normally, given that this is her second and last term, she should be a lame duck president. Uh, but her government's success in handling COVID-19 and the publicity globally uh, that this has attracted for the Taiwanese government appears to have, at least for the time being, uh, mitigated those effects. So she's uh, quite popular right now. Uh, and uh, that should continue for, for quite a while. Uh, what also has helped her is the fact that the KMT is in, is in complete disarray right now uh, and has been unable to counter it. And even efforts by them to weaken, weaken the administration uh, have failed or on some occasions they've even backfired. So Tsai is, for the time being, on quite uh, solid ground. The fact that she has been receiving vocal support uh, by United States, uh, more recently by European Union as well. Uh, again, the high profile visit by Czech Republic have also bolstered Taiwan's confidence, uh, as has the publicity generated by the handling of the pandemic. Uh, and I don't think, I mean, I've been in Taiwan for 15, 15 years. I don't think I've ever seen so much international coverage uh, of Taiwan in, in, in various media worldwide, not just in the United States. Uh, and that has been noticed and certainly reported upon uh, here in Taiwan as well. Uh, meanwhile, and riding upon, upon that wave, the Thai government remains committed and seeks to increase uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, fora, uh, example of which is uh, the Global Cooperation Training Framework, uh, which not only involves the United States and Taiwan, but increasingly countries like Japan, with Sweden, Sweden uh, Canada has hinted at possible role at some point as well in Australia and others. Uh, so Taiwan is being positioned uh, in the middle of these, these activities. 
uh, and that uh, also reflects a greater willingness on the Thai government's uh, desire for engaging, uh, you know, medium power democracies as well. And again, the Czech Republic having set that precedent and demonstrating that it's survivable, uh, other countries should, uh, we expect, would be willing to engage Taiwan at this level as well. Uh, at long last, there are plans by the Tsai administration to launch an English language uh, media platform, i.e. that is a television uh, network, uh, which certainly could contribute to Taiwan's public diplomacy abroad. So that's going to take a little while yet before they launch that TV station, but uh, they're moving in the right direction. Uh, Tsai's red lines on Taiwan's sovereignty, meanwhile, remain unchanged. Uh, and we have seen a greater willingness since her re-election, and probably because of the atmosphere in the Taiwan Strait, uh, to address uh, you know more symbolic issues, such as the redesigning of the uh, the ROC passport that really prominently uh, displays Taiwan, and the ROC has gotten much smaller. Uh, and now there is talk as well at uh, Minister of Transportation and Communication to possibly rename China Airlines. Uh, ostensibly to reduce the confusion over the naming of that airline with Air China. Uh, despite all this, the Thai government must still strike a balance between those efforts uh, and continuing to appeal to the middle ground, uh, which has you know, buttressed the successful administration that she has had so far. Um, and she must also, I mean, the, uh, as Shelley said, Hong Kong certainly was uh, beneficial to President Tsai, particularly early last year uh, when she was struggling in the polls and whatnot. Uh, but now, besides the opportunities, it also creates a bit of a headache for her administration, uh, especially when it comes to young people from Hong Kong seeking asylum in Taiwan. Uh, her administration has made it clear that they will provide assistance, but at the same time, they also must do so carefully uh, so that uh, China will not retaliate against Taiwan for the type of assistance uh, that it provides. But anyway, they have created an agency uh, under the Ministry uh, of the Mainland Affairs Council uh, to provide assistance to people from Hong Kong uh, seeking to establish themselves in, in Taiwan, not just refugees, but also ordinary people and business people. Uh, the response to the more frequent PLA contingencies uh, are straining and tiring the Taiwanese military. Uh, it also compels the government to do everything it can to avoid uh, accidents or incidents or overreaction that could quickly uh, result in escalation. Uh, on repeated occasions, Taipei has had to dispel disinformation coming from China. Uh, more recently over the alleged shooting down by the Taiwanese of the Su-35 Chinese aircraft. Uh, a lot of that uh, spread on social media and uh, mostly on ostensibly Indian accounts, uh, but we have yet to pinpoint where the actual claim originated. It might have come from China, we don't, we don't know yet. Um, at long last also, there seems to be some movement in upgrading the reserve forces. Uh, in Taiwan, which would be called upon uh, if there were an amphibious assault against Taiwan. Uh, but here again, the extent of the progress uh, remains remains to be seen. But certainly, uh, as as was said earlier, the fact that President Tsai uh, has had several media opportunities uh, involving the armed forces seems to signal a greater willingness to promote the military, and hopefully that will be accompanied by uh, necessary reform as well. And one last point, uh, prosecution of espionage and co-optation cases uh, continues to result in very light sent sentences in Taiwan, uh, which in my opinion undermines the Taiwan's deterrent against this type of behavior, uh, and also encourages the perception abroad that Taiwan does not take these things seriously. So that's another issue that I hope will be uh, addressed uh, by the Taiwanese and by the courts. Uh, there ought to be a minimum sentencing for espionage cases. Right now, there isn't. So depending on who is the sitting judge in those cases, some people will get away with a little more than a year uh, imprisonment for uh, having engaged in espionage on behalf of the PRC. Uh, and the National Communications Commission also uh, 
is will possibly start uh, moving against some of the so-called red media uh, in Taiwan. So that is uh, media that are complicit in the spreading of pro-CCP disinformation in Taiwan. So that's uh, pretty much a snapshot of what's been going on in the Taiwan Strait over the past uh, the past year or so. Thanks so much, Michael, for this uh, wonderful overview of uh, the complex uh, dynamics um, across the Taiwan Straits. Um, next, we'll have Bonnie Glazier uh, kind of expand on uh, Beijing's policies towards Taiwan. Well, thank you, uh, Jennifer, and thank you to GTI for including me in your uh, symposium this year. Uh, I've been asked to talk about Beijing's policy and uh, approaches toward Taiwan. So I'll start by saying that the PRC's goal for Taiwan is clear, is uh, integrating Taiwan into, uh, into China, uh, which of course the Chinese refer to as reunification. And in his political report to the 19th Party Congress, uh, Xi Jinping stated that reunification is, quote, critical to the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation in the new era. And then in, in his speech marking the 40th uh, anniversary of the message to compatriots in Taiwan uh, on January 2nd of 2019, Xi Jinping declared that uh, our country must be reunified and will surely be reunified. Uh, he also said, of course, that China would not renounce the use of force against Taiwan. So PRP, PRC pressure uh, on Taiwan is unrelenting uh, and has been ramped up significantly since President Tsai's re-election in January. PLA Navy ships uh, are frequently transiting the Taiwan Strait. Bombers and fighters regularly circumnavigate the island. They trespass into Taiwan's air defense identification zone, uh, which was noted by Ambassador Xiao early this morning. Um, and of course, they occasionally make deliberate incursions across uh, the center line. Beijing has also increased its efforts to isolate Taiwan uh, by excluding it from the international community. Uh, it has pressured countries to not conclude free trade agreements uh, with Taiwan, as John Lee noted this morning. Uh, it has induced countries that had diplomatic ties with Taiwan to switch to the PRC. Uh, it is uh, since President Tsai was first elected uh, president in January of 2016, uh, the PRC has poached eight of Taiwan's diplomatic allies, leaving it with uh, 15. Uh, China doggedly blocks Taiwan's participation in international governmental organizations, including, of course, the World Health Organization. Uh, this year, more than 20 countries, including the U.S.-led Group of Eight, expressed support for Taiwan being invited as an observer to the World Health Assembly. At a time when the world is experiencing a pandemic and Taiwan has undertaken one of the best public health responses in the world, this is truly unconscionable. Despite the strong rejection of the one country, two systems formula by the Taiwanese people and Beijing's decision to quash Hong Kong's autonomy by imposing national security legislation, the Chinese Communist Party continues to push for applying one country, two systems to Taiwan. After President Tsai's landslide re-election, Politburo Standing Committee member Wang Yang reiterated the one country, two systems model and the one China principle as core components of Beijing's policy. Uh, the PRC has stepped up uh, espionage against Taiwan, targeting uh, government agencies, um, emails account of officials, uh, leading and leading companies uh, as well. Cyber attacks against government networks number uh, at last count that uh, a number was released at approximately 30 million per month. About half of those uh, apparently come from China. Among the objectives are undermining Taiwan's elections, uh, compromising its critical infrastructure, crippling its, its financial trade, um, and stealing intellectual property. And Taiwan's semiconductor industry has particularly con come under sustained assault uh, from PRC hackers. 
China also continues to strengthen United Front tactics against Taiwan. Uh, in in um, uh, Wang Yang's report uh, to the Chinese People's Political Consultative uh, Conference earlier this year in May, he called for deepening exchanges and contacts with relevant uh, political party groups, social organizations, and persons from uh, various walks of life on Taiwan. Uh, as uh, Michael Cole noted, disinformation from the PRC is rampant in Taiwan as the PRC seeks to undermine Taiwan's democratic processes and the confidence of the public in its government. Campaigns by CCP-linked actors targeted uh, the 2020 presidential election as well as its response to COVID-19 with narratives crafted to advance Beijing's interest. Articles in the PRC media and PLA WeChat accounts regularly call for taking military action against Taiwan. Uh, the Taiwan Affairs Office often issues warnings uh, against uh, so-called Taiwan independence and what it calls separatist activities. When pressed in closed door meetings to cite examples of President Tsai's alleged provocative actions, uh, PRC experts failed to come up with persuasive, concrete examples, uh, pointing only to a, a vague agenda of what they see as decentification. I'm inclined to think that those experts in China who follow Taiwan closely are really quite aware that President Tsai has been prudent and cautious and has at times restrained more radical elements of her party from pushing measures that Beijing might view as provocative. Domestic politics in China, I believe, is likely a factor in the analysis of these Chinese experts, their public analysis, leading them to blame Tsai uh, for the status quo, uh, for changing the status quo in cross-strait relations. Facing an economic slowdown, unprecedented tensions with the United States, and growing criticism from around the world for its handling of Hong Kong, um, its incarceration of Uyghurs and its wolf warrior diplomacy. Taiwan provides a useful and potent emotional distraction uh, for China. Um, and of course, a means to forge national unity and uh, strengthen support for the party. I think the CCP is, is probably losing confidence that its approach toward Taiwan will succeed in bringing about its reunification goal. Beijing pays close attention to public opinion polls in Taiwan. Uh, it knows uh, that the percentage of the public that supports unification now or in the future is at historic lows. Um, and as uh, Shelley Rigger noted, the percentage of people who favor independence is growing as well as those who identify themselves uh, as Taiwanese. Beijing is particularly worried about the future of the KMT and its commitment to the 1992 census. Uh, Xi Jinping did not send a congratulatory message uh, to KMT Chairman Johnny Jiang after his election. In the KMT Reform Committee subgroup on cross-strait issues um, uh, recommended that the 1992 consensus be considered a historical position rather than a basis for cross-strait ex exchanges. Instead, the Taiwan Affairs Office issued a statement urging uh, uh, Chairman Jiang to adhere to the 1992 consensus uh, on One China. And the recent KMT Congress, which resurrected the 1992 consensus, uh, but attempted to redefine its content, emphasizing respect for the ROC constitution, likely did not allay Beijing's concerns. Nevertheless, the CCP has not declared that its policy toward Taiwan has failed. Despite the adoption of tougher tactics against Taiwan, Xi Jinping has not abandoned the policy guideline of peaceful development of cross-strait relations, which he inherited from Hu Jintao. And when the National People's Congress opened in May, it appeared maybe the CCP was signaling its patience was wearing thin when Premier Li Keqiang omitted the descriptor peaceful uh, and simply called for reunification in his work report. But then at the press conference, at the closing of the two meetings, Lee again referred to the goal of peaceful unification. 
Um, it's also notable that a Xinhua report on the meeting marking the 15th anniversary of the anti-secession law used the phrase Heping Tongyi, peaceful reunification, a dozen times. PRC statements about Taiwan have remained relatively consistent. Uh, we haven't heard any private warnings indicating alarm. Um, and many of you know that during Chen Shui-bian's presidency, when preparations were underway to hold a referendum on whether Taiwan should enter the UN under the name Taiwan, there were consistent and clear private messages, both from Chinese officials and, and think tank experts, that cross-strait relations were entering a period of high danger. No such warnings are being heard today. Beijing's bottom line is that Taiwan cannot declare de jure independence. That is the only real casus belli, and both Shelley Rigger and I have written about this in recent months. There is an evidence that the PRC has concluded that unification can only be achieved through force, or that unification must be accomplished in the near future. It's clear that Xi Jinping has the ambition to set in motion an irreversible trend toward unification, and he wants to make progress toward this goal during his term in office. He's twice stated the differences between the two sides of the strait should not be passed down from generation to generation. This suggests that Xi Jinping is indeed impatient, but not that unification is so urgent a priority that he will put other Chinese interests at risk to achieve that objective. We should fully expect that Xi Jinping will continue to say that reunification is inevitable, and we should also expect that he will not renounce the use of force. But as long as Xi Jinping is confident that the PRC can use its ever-expanding coercion toolkit to prevent Taiwan from going independent, he doesn't need to preemptively use force against Taiwan. To be sure, deterrence is eroding primarily due to the shift in the military balance. Both the U.S. and Taiwan have a great deal to do to shore up deterrence by making credible their ability and willingness to defend Taiwan. And both of our countries also need to develop effective ways to counter Beijing's gray zone coercion. That's a topic, apparently, that will be addressed uh, in the final panel of GTI Symposium uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I look forward to hearing uh, the participants tomorrow address that issue. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Bonnie, for this very detailed account of Beijing's uh, pressure tactics against Taiwan. Uh, it's been very insightful. Um, now I'd like to turn to Ambassador Stephen Young, who will discuss not only U.S. policy towards Taiwan, but also uh, U.S. policy towards Hong Kong. Well, thank you, and uh, it's nice to be here. I, I hope this isn't a, an indication of uh, cross-strait relations, but it turned very cold overnight here up in uh, New Hampshire. It was 37 degrees in the morning, so winter is starting to creep in on us. Um, I've been asked to link Hong Kong to a bit with uh, what's going on in Taiwan, and I'm happy to do that. Um, my first job in Taiwan back in 1981, um, Chuck Cross was the uh, director of the AIT. He was the first director of AIT. And I have the distinction of being the only person other than Chuck who served both as the director of AIT and also uh, the Consul General in Hong Kong. And I remember um, when Ambassador Cross gave his farewell remarks uh, just as he was heading off into retirement uh, in, I think, 1982, he um, expressed a, a sentiment that has always stuck with me in talking to the staff of AIT. I think there was some media there too. He said um, that he left Taiwan with great confidence that this new entity, which was the result of the break in relations in 19, 
uh, 78 was going to be just fine. Taiwan was going to be just fine. And uh, um, several decades later, I feel the same way. Taiwan is going to be just fine, even though it faces new challenges all the time. It uh, it comes up with creative strategies to uh, to uh, address both its own domestic, uh, economic, and political challenges, but also the ever-present threat that Bonnie and and Michael have and Shelley have have discussed with 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 uh, a fairly belligerent China, particularly under Xi Jinping. Um, I remember as a young officer, uh, I was a note taker in a meeting when the British DCM came in to brief State Roy on their talks with uh, with Beijing on the turnover of Hong Kong. And it was a very gloomy readout of, of frustration on the British part that, that the Chinese just weren't giving an inch. And um, as as the British DCM left, he said, it would really be helpful if you, the United States, could weigh in with Beijing on our behalf. And uh, state politely, you know, nodded and saw the guy out and then turned to me and said, <laughs> as if that would make any difference, you know, for us to go to Beijing and say, stop being so tough on Britain, Britain for Hong Kong. Uh, Obviously, we continued to hold hope that the promises under Deng Xiaoping for a Hong Kong that would enjoy a great deal of autonomy and would be left on its own for 50 years would hold true. Um, and uh, for a while, I suppose, there was some hope of that. Uh, uh, but. Then came Tiananmen, and, and of course, uh, the true color of the PRC regime was, was revealed to any skeptics uh, that remained. Uh, and um, on, on the subject of, of Hong Kong, uh, following a fairly tranquil turnover in 1997, uh, it just wasn't long before Beijing, in fits and and starts, began to squeeze Hong Kong, and particularly uh, as protests, massive protests, began to take place in Hong Kong, the, the British, uh, the, the Chinese reaction was not to to adjust in a more moderate fashion, but to become tougher. Um, We've seen, I think there was a first wave of this in 2004, and there have been a couple of since, and each time Beijing has been tougher and tougher. And now you have this national security law, which eviscerates many of the promises of one country, two system, and uh, has now resulted in the introduction of uh, PRC security forces, uh, into Hong Kong and with less than half of that 50 year period uh, having transpired, I think it's safe to say that uh, Hong Kong, if not lost, is is circling around the drain in terms of its ability to to uh, dictate its own domestic politics. Uh, I'm puzzled by Beijing's reaction to this. I'm puzzled by a lot of things that Xi Jinping does because uh, they seem to be so short-sighted. And yet, um, here's a guy who has uh, really trampled on uh, most of the pledges Deng Xiaoping offered up to Hong Kong and with less than uh, half of the 50 years gone, I, I think it's safe to say that the... Uh, promise of a great deal of autonomy is 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 in tatters. Uh, why he's done this is is something I puzzle over having served in Beijing as well as Hong Kong. Um, maybe he's trying to distract his own people's a attention from the sagging economy, although why Hong Kong would serve as a sop to them is something I cannot understand. Uh, but for whatever reason, 
here in 2020, I think, um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the government of Hong Kong has been very supine in its reactions. Uh, I knew Carrie Lam when I was working there, and I, I'm disappointed by her um, shift toward a much more servile attitude toward the PRC, although I can understand the pressure she must be under. Uh, and all that signals for the few people in Taiwan who thought that China would be good with its promises is that, is that you can't trust anything the Chinese say or write down. Um, and I think uh, Tsai Ing-wen is the right person to manage this challenge today. I am not a huge fan of the current American administration, but they have done some good things with Hong Kong, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm a little sorry that John Bolton left because I know John was a big fan of both Hong Kong and Taiwan, and uh, um, I think his voice would have been useful within this administration today as the challenges uh, pile up there. And, and um, uh, President Trump could use some good advisors around him, it seems, if he would be willing to listen to them. Um, so I think that the real challenge today is uh, how Taiwan responds to the new reality. Uh, fortunately, it has some very good friends in the, on the Hill, uh, both on the, the Republican and Democratic side. They've been passing legislation. Uh, they've, been, they've been visiting uh, uh, Taiwan, and they've been making clear that it is, uh, if not a vital interest, a very important interest to us that Taiwan maintain the essential uh, freedoms that it, it has uh, enjoyed now for so long. And I think that that's important. Um, we have an election coming up this year. Uh, and uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see what the winner of the election, particularly if it's Joe Biden, is going to do about all this, because he's not really said very much that I'm aware of about uh, how he would manage uh, either China or cross-strait relations. Uh, but I do think that the continuation of arms sales and the symbolism that they uh, reflect of our commitment to the security of Taiwan is a good sign. Uh, and I think that uh, while we can quibble over the nature of sales, whether it should be this model of airplane or, or, or whether tanks really serve a, a purpose in defending a, a, a maritime nation, are less important than the symbolism that all of this provides. Uh, in, in short, I remain cautiously confident that Taiwan can weather current challenges. Uh, Madam Tsai, who I've known for over 20 years, has been doing a terrific job, and she's got some very good people working with her. Uh, but um, it's going to be important whoever wins this election in America, that they reinforce the strong commitment we have to Taiwan's uh, freedom and autonomy, and to do that in concrete means by uh, sending high-level visitors, by uh, approving necessary arms sales, and by treating Taiwan with the respect that one of the most vibrant democracies in East Asia deserves. So um, I hope that I leave you with a somewhat um, cautiously optimistic perspective on what's going on there. Like all of you, I watch always with a sense of nervousness about what might happen next in terms of PRC actions here. and. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, the strong and vocal support 
by the United States is an important pillar of Taiwan's stability in the coming years. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Ambassador Young, uh, for your observations on the situation in Hong Kong. Um, last but not least, we have um, Richard Bush, who will be speaking about the upcoming U.S. presidential election and its potential impact on cross-strait relations. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. Can everybody hear me? Good. Yes. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to participate in GTI's uh, annual symposium. Um, I would note um, that while my friends and colleagues on the panel have gotten to talk about the past and the present, I'm the poor schmuck who has to talk about the future, which, of course, uh, I don't can't predict. Uh, so what I'm going to provide you is speculation. Um, and I don't have a perfect record in my speculation, but uh, for what it's worth, here we go. Um, if President Trump is reelected, um, I would expect a good degree of continuity in U.S. relations uh, with Taiwan. I think there will continue to be progress in the security relationship and in diplomacy. Congress's support will be favorable. Um, it will be interesting to see if uh, U.S.-China tensions uh, in East Asia can be dialed down a little bit because I think that does create a danger of entrapping Taiwan, which we wouldn't want to see. Um, I'm uh, more pessimistic when it comes to trade. Um, and I think both because of the sort of approach that USTR has taken and because of uh, Trump's basic protectionist mindset, I'm not confident that we would see um, any movement uh, to uh, um, a free trade area. I hope I'm wrong on that. I really do, uh, but um, I, I just don't have confidence. Um, the The more interesting question is what happens if uh, Joe Biden wins, um, and that's the, going to be the focus of my remarks. I would um, start by pointing out that Joe Biden is one of the few Americans who is still active in public life who voted for the Taiwan Relations Act. And he was a member of the Foreign Affairs, uh, the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee, uh, which did the work on the TRA. So uh, there's a long history here, and that's important. Uh, the safest statement I can make about a Biden administration is that it's, uh, it's just too early to say. Uh, there will be a lot of speculation. There will be a lot of rumors. Um, I, a lot of those will be wrong. Uh, and so we're just going to have to wait and see. Um, I must emphasize that uh, an important context for our Taiwan policy in a Biden administration will be what changes, if any, occur in U.S.-China relations. I'm not saying that uh, an improvement in U.S.-China relations means a lessening of our relationship with Taiwan, not at all, um, but it is an important context. And I think the key question is here, here is, um, can uh, Washington and Beijing revive some degree of cooperation to serve as a balance uh, with the uh, competition that will continue? Um, can the United States re-engage on climate issues, on Iran, on public health, on North Korea, uh, in, and, and cooperate with Beijing to some extent? I have no idea. Um, we will not know this right away. Uh, what I would actually expect um, uh, after January 20th is that there will be a policy review where um, past policy uh, will be considered and various priorities will be hashed out, including Taiwan. Um, but um, the, um, as I say, it's not a zero sum situation. Um, I would make um, several more points. First, I think on the key question uh, um, in U.S. policy towards Taiwan, uh, that is with respect to cross-strait relations, um, th there is going to be continuity. Although I don't pay too much attention to party platforms in an election year, 
I think uh, the Democratic platform uh, on this key point is rings true. Uh, to quote, Democrats are committed to the TRA and will continue to support a peaceful resolution of cross-strait relations consistent with the wishes and best interests of the people of Taiwan. Um, the unstated message here to Beijing is, it's up to you, Beijing, to convince the Taiwan people uh, that your policies and objectives towards the island meet with their approval. Um, the greatest opportunity going forward in U.S. policy towards Taiwan, and the compelling issue, I think, is to radically improve uh, our economic relationship. The best way to do that, the most efficient way, is through a bi bilateral trade agreement. Um, this would have the great advantage of of reducing Taiwan's marginalization in the international economy. Um, it would um, foster a structural adjustment uh, within Taiwan uh, that will break a number of the log jams uh, necessary uh, 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 to keep Taiwan competitive. Um, but it, this does require a strategic decision by the President of the United States and a directive uh, to the U.S. Trade Representative uh, to move in this direction. Um, but I think um, a key development and and something that gives me hope is President Tsai's uh, courageous decision last month on pork. So on uh, trade and a bilateral trade agreement, the ball is now definitely in America's court. Um, on security issues, I think uh, that uh, there will be continuity. Um, I agree that uh, the party uh, that is changing the status quo is not Taiwan or the United States, it's China, um, and it's doing it through coercion without violence. Now, looking at the U.S.-Taiwan security relationship, um, I think the degree and content of security cooperation depends in part on Taiwan's defense strategy and how well it takes account of the threat, changes in the threat environment and changes in its resources. I think that Taiwan can help itself um, by fully implementing uh, the overall defense concept, um, which the United States has encouraged, and aligning procurement actions with the ODC. Uh, all, there is work that also needs to be done on personnel but the United States will take note of this. Um, I would observe that there are calls for the United States to move to strategic clarity uh, concerning intervention in a cross-strait conflict. Um, my, my own thoughts on this are, first of all, that whether the U.S. would intervene uh, would depend very much on how the specific conflict develops. Um, obviously, it is not in the U.S. or Taiwan's interest for Beijing to believe that the United States will not intervene, and so the task of policy is to convince it that uh, it will. Um, I would note that there are many ways to communicate U.S. intentions besides declaratory policy. Um, moreover, deterrence is not built on words alone. It depends on whether the United States has the capabilities to back up uh, any threat to uh, intervene. And Randy Shriver told us in the previous session uh, that the situation is changing. But in, uh, the basic point is China, of course, will listen to what we say, but it will also watch what we do. Um, there is a bit of good news here. Um, one of um, Joe Biden's uh, close advisors is Michelle Flournoy. Um, there's a good chance, I think, that she will be Secretary of Defense. She had a recent um, um, essay in Foreign Affairs um, in which she talked about the danger of PRC miscalculation and the absolute importance of uh, rebuilding our capabilities in the Western Pacific. Um, that is uh, good news for Taiwan. It would take a while to actually carry out, uh, but um, I think that's a good sign. Uh, I'll stop here.
Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Richard. Uh, we've so we've had five excellent presentations on a number of issues uh, facing Taiwan and cross strait relations. Right now, we'll move into the moderated Q and uh, moderated session before turning to a Q and A with our virtual audience. Uh, this is just a reminder for those watching um, the online stream <clears throat> to please submit your questions for our panelists. Uh, I wanted to uh, start. Uh, by going back to Taiwan's domestic political scene, and um, several, a number of our panelists had um, raised the issue of the 1992 consensus. Um, and um, given that we see the KMT struggling as a, a, a major um, opposition party, um, and um, the KMT chairman Johnny Jiang's recent decision to uh, still uh, keep the 1992 consensus as part of his party platform. Um, I was wondering if um, if I could get um, you know your reactions to uh, why um, why this decision was made. If it was more of um, a political domestic political decision to um, appease kind of the older guard of of the KMT, um, and and what attempts the KMT has. Uh, taken to um, really bridge, you know, this um, kind of older concept with the newer generation, for example, those who are born after 1992. Um, and I think, Michael, you mentioned that, you know, um, there has been a, a reinterpretation of 1992 consensus that is that is that differs from you know the Mayanjo administration. So uh, I was wondering, Michael, if you could um, kind of give us your take on on how um, you evaluate uh, the KMT's decision to kind of still retain uh, this concept as part of its party platform. Right. Well, um, I mean, I've always argued that being the president of Taiwan is a very difficult job. Uh, I would say that at the moment, being KMT chairman also is a very difficult job. Uh, I do not envy Johnny Jiang. Uh, he faces a very difficult challenge in, in trying to reconstruct his party, uh, particularly following the Hangul wave as well. That was quite divisive. Uh, for Johnny, uh, I mean, the KMT will hold uh, chairmanship elections next year. My sense is that he understands full well that the party needs to figure out how to appeal to the general public. And the perceptions changing, uh, self-identification as, as Taiwanese, opposition to unification and whatnot, uh, developments in China, a more assertive Xi Jinping, uh, the, the fate of Hong Kong, have all contributed to uh, shifting perceptions in Taiwan. Uh, for all its ills, I maintain that the KMT remains committed to uh, being a participant in, in, in Taiwanese democracy, uh, which ne means that it needs to find ways to win elections. Uh, the past two elections have not uh, proven to be quite successful ones for the KMT. Uh, my view is that Johnny, as a member of the younger generation, you know, younger in KMT, uh, KMT speak does not mean very young. Uh, but he is indeed uh, part of that generation. Uh, I, my sense is that he gets uh, what would appeal to ordinary Taiwanese and, and the young, politically active ones as well. The problem that he faces is the old guards. Uh, they still control the money. They still have retained uh, substantial influence on the party. Uh, factions like Huang Fuxing, for example, that is very conservative, that was very supportive of Hong Kong, uh, are probably not very pleased with the things that he has said about cross-strait relations and 1992 consensus in recent months. Uh, and for Johnny, if he really wants to be uh, fully elected as party chairman, needs to strike a balance between his ambitions, uh, but also uh, appeasing uh, the old guard within the KMT. There is speculation that if he indeed succeeds in being elected, he would have a more solid base and then could move towards uh, more uh, more substantial reform of the party. That's again speculation, but that seems uh, seems to make sense. Uh, but my view ultimately is that uh, he is trying to reformulate without completely abandoning uh, the notion of the 1992 consensus, uh, 
uh, and figure out a way that would possibly give the KMT an advantage over the DPP uh, in that they would be uh, better able to uh, to have dialogue with uh, with China. But the intransigence that we have seen on 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 the Chinese side on that particular issue uh, makes it very difficult. The room to maneuver for for room for maneuver for the KMT is quite uh, it's quite narrow right now. So he faces an extraordinary challenge. Uh, my sense is that there's quite a number of people in the KMT who understand that they need to rethink 92 consensus. They need to rethink whatever formula that they come up with next to engage China. Uh, but that the other side is not making it easy for them and democratic forces in Taiwan being what they are, uh, they cannot afford to not reflect those desires by the Taiwanese public. So good luck to good luck to them. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this, this question is for Bonnie. Um, as China's global economic position declines, and uh, particularly under the effects of the U.S.-China trade war, um, has the economic factor played less of a um, role in maintaining cooperative relations um, across the Taiwan Strait? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think that uh, China has not abandoned the idea of uh, promoting economic integration between Taiwan and uh, mainland China. Uh, but I think that they recognize that their economic inducements, uh, along with other measures, you know, the 31 measures and other means that they have used, uh, have not really achieved much success. But uh, senior Chinese officials, uh, such as uh, Wang Yang, uh, in the uh, during the two meetings earlier this year in uh, in Beijing, uh, certainly did not uh, uh, veer away from the notion of of continuing to give inducements uh, to Taiwan. Uh, we have not yet seen uh, that I can detect. Uh, perhaps others have uh, any uh, economic pressure. Uh, coercion on uh, against those Taiwanese companies that are uh, operating on the mainland. And we know, of course, that more and more are diversifying their operations and uh, some have moved factories back to Taiwan. Uh, that's probably a trend that Beijing is quite concerned about. Uh, so this would be a counterproductive time, I think, to move to using more coercive practices uh, against Taiwan economically. So the main uh, uh, lever of coercion that has been used against Taiwan, of course, quite publicly, is uh, the reduction in the number of tourists that are permitted uh, to go to Taiwan. Uh, I don't know if there's been a reduction in uh, students. That would be an interesting indicator to look at the number of students who are going from uh, from the mainland to Taiwan. That's, of course, not, not particularly about economic uh, issues. Um, but uh, there, I, I think it's important to look at a range uh, of ways in which China might use coercion uh, uh, against uh, Taiwan. So I think economic integration remains a goal, uh, but there is probably diminishing confidence that economic integration is going to lead to the political object objectives that, that that Beijing seeks to achieve. All right, thank you. Oh, uh, Richard, you have a, you wanted to add something? Um, a quick comment. Uh, I would just add to Bonnie's list uh, that um, there's a huge economic impact for Taiwan but, uh, that results from China's effective exclusion of Taiwan from groups like RCEP. Um, and CPTPP indirectly, because that um, means that Taiwan companies, if they want to survive, need to move behind the tariff barrier in order to get the benefits, and that has impact on domestic economy in Taiwan. Thanks. Thanks. And of course, also bilateral trade agreements, which I think many of us referred to earlier, will make it more difficult for uh, for Taiwan. So absolutely, those are those are very important points. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Um, so I think we'll now move to the audience questions. Um, so this um, question is for Shelley Rigger. 
Uh, it comes from Emma Robinson, analyst at a DC defense consulting firm. Um, it says that younger generations of Taiwanese are increasingly secure in their national identity. What impact might this have on the future of identity politics and Chinese soft power efforts? Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, this is actually something that from a, this is like a little bit of a nerdy response, but from a social scientific standpoint has been bothering me for a while because we've always treated national identity as a variable, uh, which we want to use to predict other things. And among the youngest Taiwanese, so you know, up to the age of 30, there's no, there's almost no variation on this. I mean, they 100% of them pretty much or 98% say they're Taiwanese. So it's a, it's a population that has a very um, uniform identification with Taiwan. But I think the question is whether or how that translates into policy preferences. So and just to give you an example, you know, I spent a fair amount of time with young KMT members last year when I was in Taiwan from September to April, trying to understand how uh, young KMT folks see the world and, you know, why they're in the KMT. And even they would say that their identity is as Taiwanese, right? And even though they have a strong attachment to the Republic of China, they recognize themselves as Taiwanese. So the question is, what are the sort of policy implications of that identification? And I don't think it's obvious. You know, I think you can call yourself Taiwanese and desire independence, and you can call yourself Taiwanese and desire the status quo. And that is why we always see the preference for independence lagging behind the preference for or the identification as Taiwanese is a lot of people think of themselves as Taiwanese, but that doesn't mean they want to provoke a war with, with Beijing. So what's been really interesting to me over the last year and a half is the degree to which uh, some Taiwanese, at least, and especially young people, are less persuaded or less constrained by the threat of military attack than has been the case in the past. And so we begin to see um, a little more willingness to say, you know, I don't, I think we can do it. You know, I think we could, we could fight back successfully. Is that anywhere close to a plurality or a majority position? No, it is not. But it is definitely something that's more common among young people in Taiwan than the older age groups. All right, thank you. Our next question is for Richard Bush. Um, question comes from Gary Sands, senior analyst at Wikistrat. He said, is the unprecedented level of support for Taiwan on the, the current US administration expected to continue under a potential Biden administration? Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I would first start by um, noting that uh, in some ways, uh, the United States support for Taiwan um, is lacking. And this is particularly in the area of economics and trade. Um, and this creates a, a really puzzling situation. Um, our relations have continued to develop under the, uh, in, in the security areas and the diplomatic areas. Uh, Congress is gung-ho. But on, um, when it comes to uh, a free trade agreement, um, USTR has taken the, the position that unless Tsai Ing-wen makes uh, difficult concessions on market access for pork, nothing's going to happen. So from a strategic point of view, this makes no sense. We're treating Taiwan in very, two very different ways. Um, so, but I've um, outlined, I think, that um, uh, I th in a Biden administration, you know, pending the policy review and everything that gets done there, pending who's selected in key positions, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of continuity. I hope that the Biden administration will um, show initiative where the, the Trump administration has shown recalcitrance and move forward quickly um, on a bilateral trade agreement. Um, I think that the Biden administration will have a better policy process 
uh, than the Trump administration has had. That's, that's a low bar, I know. Um, but having a good policy process in the United States is really important for small countries. It's only when you have a, a good process that small countries get mentioned. Um, otherwise, it's um, uh, they get ignored. I would also say that um, a number of the people who are likely to have positions in the Biden administration, and I'm, I'm making no predictions here, um, they understand the Taiwan issue. They've been to Taiwan. There's a basic uh, empathy with Taiwan's uh, position, and there is a an understanding that our definition of our interests and Taiwan's definition of its interests have converged in the last 12 years, and that's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to give Ambassador Young the chance um, to answer the last question, which comes from me, which is, uh, do you think the U.S. Um, actions vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong, especially um, taking away Hong Kong's special trade status and imposing sanctions, uh, will it risk harming the people of Hong Kong or will it actually impose a cost on Beijing? You unmuted me, right? You can hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I, I'm very conflicted on Hong Kong because uh, I think supporting the people of Hong Kong is so important. Uh, and for this administration to look at things in Hong Kong for uh, the lamentable t turn of events there that is primarily driven by the PRC is unfortunate in the sense that it it for its ordinary people in Taiwan in Hong Kong excuse me um I I have to just say to Richard's point that uh even though Taiwan's small it's our 10th largest or 11th largest trade partner so um you know the trade is 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 not insignificant although I must say uh, uh I'm got so sick of ractopamine arguments back in the day because uh, it 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 held hostage such a broader uh, wave of uh, economic cooperation for what's really a very secondary uh, factor for American pork producers. But I'm glad that Madam Tsai finally uh, took some steps on that. Um, overall, I, I think that um, uh, our relationship is pretty good in trade. And uh, um, I know there's, uh, I mean, one of the things that impresses me is that I want to say it's uh, 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 Terry Gowan is that TSMC wants to uh, create a, a manufacturing facility somewhere in the United States, is it Louisiana or somewhere? Uh, 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 these are our welcome uh, uh, steps to strengthen our bilateral uh, economic relations with Taiwan. Uh, and I, I hope more of that will, will take place. Thank you so much. Uh, it seems that we do have um, a little bit more, a few more minutes left. Um, so on the question of Hong Kong, there's also a related question uh, to Shelley Rigger from Emily Hu, uh, intern at GTI. And she said, within Taiwanese domestic politics, what are some of the perspectives on granting asylum to Hong Kongers? Uh, do you think Taiwan is moving towards embracing a more welcoming immigration policy? Okay, so uh, Michael mentioned this already, and I think um, did a really good job of just pointing out that this is a little bit of a, of a tricky one because uh, Taiwan, especially under the DPP for more than a few years has been, and, and actually this was also somewhat true under the Ma administration, been trying to make itself more welcoming, more friendly toward immigration. And in some ways, Hong Kong people feel like the ideal immigrants to Taiwan. I mean, uh, the ones who, many of the people who would be coming are young. Taiwan is an aging society. They are well-educated which is always, uh, it's always good to get, you know, fresh human capital. 
they uh, and in many cases they have money. Um, and you know, human capital, financial capital, what's not to love? And yet, in Taiwan, there is this perception that immigrants are, especially young, educated immigrants, are competition for job opportunities. Young people in Taiwan feel like their opportunities are too limited, uh, wages are too low, and so on. And I think that, I think fundamentally the problem, the, the blockage that needs to be broken in order for uh, Taiwanese to wholeheartedly recognize the opportunity that um, immigrants from Hong Kong present. And this is leaving aside something else that Michael mentioned, which is the very important issue of how Beijing might react to um, a policy change on this front in Taiwan. Um, but leaving that aside, I think the logjam that needs to be broken is the, the difficulty of new business creation and the conservatism of capital in Taiwan. You know, Taiwan has lots of smart young people who have the skills and creativity to meet the challenges of a 21st century economy, global economy. And it has an awful lot of aging entrepreneurs who have money but uh, don't know what to invest in for the future. So I think, you know, if, if, if Taiwan could solve that logjam, then these young Hong Kong immigrants could flow very effectively and efficiently into new businesses that were created using existing capital and the human capital that they and their Taiwanese peers would contribute. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists today for your very insightful discussion on Taiwanese domestic politics, cross-strait relations, also Hong Kong and um, the upcoming U.S. elections. Uh, so now we um, ask our virtual audience to continue to tune in as we transition to the lunch keynote with Representative Mike Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and, and, and our panelists for, uh, for the second panel on uh, political trends and cross-strait relations that were very insightful discussion. Uh, my name is Russell Shaw. I'm the executive director of uh, the Global Taiwan Institute. Now, it's my distinct honor to introduce our, our keynote speaker, um, Congressman Mike Gallagher. Uh, he is the seventh generation Wisconsin native and represents Wisconsin's eighth district in the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, excuse me. Uh, for the second panel Let on, me just, uh, uh, I have the video pop up. And, uh, excuse me, um, and represents Wisconsin's 8th district in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, he joined the U.S. Marine Corps the day he graduated from college and served seven years on active duty as a counterintelligence, human intelligence officer, and regional affairs officer for the Middle East and North Africa, where he deployed twice to El Anbar province, Iraq, as a commander of intelligence teams. Mike currently serves as co-chair of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and on the House Armed Services and Transportation and Infrastructure Committees. Now, besides his official biography, I would add that Congressman Gallagher is really one of the leading thinkers and doers in the U.S. House of Representatives, especially among Republican members on U.S. foreign policy towards the Indo-Pacific, especially on Taiwan and China. Uh, if you have not already read some of his writings, I encourage you to read his articles in the Wall Street Journal, the American Interests, and the National Review. And I'm sure you will find, as I did, that he is a real deep thinker on strategic competition with China, uh, on China and U.S. policy towards Taiwan. I know that Congressman Gallagher is uh, rushing to a vote later, and so uh, uh, we will have to uh, end this uh, conversation a little earlier than the schedule. But nonetheless, we'll try to make the best of the time that we have with Congressman Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Congressman Gallagher. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Let's dive right in, shall we? Um, Congressman, uh, you are on record uh, for being a leading advocate for using the term uh, a new Cold War and describing the state of ongoing competition uh, between the United States and China. 
this is not an uncontroversial terminology um, within the broader policy community. Why do you think we're in a new Cold War? How do you define the term? And what are the key features? Well, it's a great question, and uh, it's been a healthy debate. Um, by the way, I'm open to a better term if I can find one that's uh, more useful. Uh, but let's start with the original. What was the Cold War? Well, it was a long-term strategic competition that played out between the world's two leading superpowers. And while the competition spanned almost every domain conceivable, I think at its heart were two competitions, a military competition and an ideological competition. And while neither side sought a general war against the other, both sought to use their distinct national advantages in their favor to outlast and, and ultimately triumph over the other. So the first thing to point out is there are obvious differences with China today, uh, and that the but the fundamental premise of a long-term but hopefully non-kinetic clash of two superpowers with very different systems, each seeking to gain an advantage in the competition seems pretty relevant to me. Uh, perhaps the biggest difference, however, in our new Cold War is the addition of a third primary front in the form of an economic and largely technological competition. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions I see relating to the terminology of a new Cold War is that it often seems accompanied by the implication of, of failure and of frustration that relations between the US and China have officially bottomed out. But I, I don't see it that way. I, I, you know, Cold War thinking, contrary to what you hear from CCP state media, is not an admission of the inevitability of conflict. To the contrary, I think at its best, Cold War thinking represents the apex of American statesmanship, balancing interests, allies, and values along a very delicate tightrope in order to deter aggression and protect our way of life while avoiding cataclysmic war. So in other words, I think we have to stop thinking about a Cold War as a worst case scenario. And I think if you'd asked most individuals of, you know, the famous Wisconsinite George Kennan's generation in 1946, if a Cold War with the Soviet Union sounded pretty good compared to either another world war or a thermonuclear exchange or outright capitulation to Soviet domination, I think you can imagine their answer. So I just would say we shouldn't be afraid of our shadow when it comes to the Cold War label. For no other reason, we can learn useful lessons from that period. What we should be afraid of is the alternative path of being in a strategic competition with an authoritarian av uh, adversary and failing to employ Cold War thinking as we did twice earlier in the 20th century with much less successful results. And so, um, go ahead. Yeah, that's, Sorry. That's great, Congressman. I mean, I think you highlighted several components of strategic competition that you emphasize as being important, the military, uh, the ideological, as well as the economic, the economic being a new sort of component to the strategic competition. But I, I would ask you to dwell a little bit on the ideological component in great power, power competition, because this is a this is a, a, a term that I think um, there seems to be some hesitancy among the broader follows, the policy community with disagreement as to whether or not this is an ideological competition or whether to frame it as such. Uh, but you seem to think that this is a, a critical component of the competition. Um, could you expand on that a bit? Please. Yeah, and I know um, I, I still have to read my my good friend Bridge Colby's argument to the contrary in foreign affairs, and and um, I think there's a a a good debate about the way in which the party uses ideology. But I mean, I think ideology is the beating heart of the competition. I think one lesson we should take from the 20th century is to take our competitors, our enemies, at their word. And if you listen to Xi. There's no doubt about the central role of ideology. Now, it can mean different things, and he can graft various forms of ideology onto to suit his needs. But studying the Soviet collapse, she has become convinced that the USSR fell not due to the weight of its oppressive system, but because of its lack of ideological fervor. I mean, as he put it, you know, the wavering of idealistic faith is the most dangerous form of wavering, and a party's decline often starts with a loss of idealistic faith. Um, so yeah, right. I think at least to she ideology in the form of absolute that, 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 that the beeping is some sort of voting, but I should have a long time before I have to vote. Uh, so okay. I'll just have to, if I look a little distracted at some point, it's because oh, no worries. Uh, it's, okay. not, it's not like if you criticize the CCP alarm, <laughs> <go> up in, <laughs> in Congress, but, uh, but my final thought would be, I think to she, at least ideology in the form of absolute obedience to the party is essential to maintaining domestic political control and safeguarding from toxic Western influence. And um, I also think that ideology is our single greatest asset 
in the competition. Um, and I think we need to sort of rediscover the sources of American conduct, conduct and uh, in order to argue for American and Western values. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Congressman. And I would just add that Bridge is uh, Colby will be speaking on our panel tomorrow on our defense and non-military coercion. So he may have some additional points to add with regards to his argument on this point. But I think your 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 uh, your your point about this being the most uh, you know sort of important asset is is, is spot on. And, and if we think about a favorable you know, sort of framework for competition to ignore this like, ideological component of it, where uh, where you know U.S. and and, and democracy. Is such an important asset. It's it would be it would be foolish to to not leverage that in the overall competition with with with, with China and authoritarian powers. Um, so in that context, uh, what role do you see U.S. allies and partners uh, in the Indo Pacific, like Japan, Australia, India, especially Taiwan, all democracies, right, uh, play in your view in 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 uh, in this uh, new Cold War with China? Well, I think, you know, maybe if ideology is our, our, our secret weapon, our alliance structure is a close second. I mean, the fact is we have a network of, of allies and partners that we built painstakingly throughout the old Cold War and in the post-Cold War moment that um, the CCP simply can't match. And uh, I know that the question of alliances has become a, a bit of a, or burden sharing among allies has become a bit of a a controversial one within my own party, let's say. But um, you know, the fact is, if you follow the logic of the Trump administration's national security strategy and its national defense strategy, which Bridge wrote, uh, so he can comment on that as well. Um, you know, you inevitably conclude that we need to be forward deployed in Indo PACOM in general. You know what Spikeman would call the Eurasian Rimland in general, but in the first island chain in particular. And I think we have some opportunities to expand our partnerships uh, with uh, longstanding allies uh, like uh, Japan uh, and Australia, uh, leveraging, for example, the fact that we're no longer bound by the INF Treaty, uh, but also to build upon um, partnerships uh, with non-democratic uh, nations in the region, uh, whether it's whether it's Vietnam or uh, or you know uh, the Philippines. Um, and so I. Uh, well, that's probably the Philippines would object to my description of them as such. Let's just say there's been there's been challenges in the relationship uh, and challenges with Duterte in particular. Uh, and so I, I really think uh, as someone who focuses on defense issues, we need to do a better job of thinking about what we and our allies bring to the fight in terms of our overall deterrent posture. And indeed, if our goal is to deter the PLA by denial, this means we need to have the capability to sink the PLA's fleet in 72 hours to borrow a goal from a Democrat, Michelle Flournoy. And that also means we need to think through, OK, what is our, what is the U.S. Navy and the Air Force doing? But also what can all of our allies do and can we count on them for various forms of support? So I think focusing on building not only stronger alliances, but more lethal allies is essential to a successful competition against China over the long term. Okay. Well, let's continue this conversation on building alliances. Uh, in a recent speech, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo suggested a need for a, quote, new grouping of like-minded nation, a new alliance of democracies, and this is end quote. And I know you addressed this in somewhat in the in diversity of political systems in, in the Indo-Pacific, but what do you think about this idea? And, and, and what about, you know, sort of Taiwan's role in it that you can envision in such a, such a new alliance? Well, int interestingly enough, I think this is an idea that um, the late Senator McCain talked about uh, frequently. It actually seems uh, it go uh, further than that. It seems like every few decades we try and form a multilateral alliance structure in Asia, and it never quite goes as we hope. And it may very well be a worthwhile goal to have down the road. But for the time being, I think we need to focus on a few other things. I mean, I would highlight at least three. One, as I alluded to before, is, is shoring up the treaty alliances that we already have and expanding cooperation across every arena and bolstering our allies against coercion, particularly economic uh, coercion. Um, the second I would say is developing a joint economic strategy to compete with China across like-minded countries that they don't necessarily need to be uh, democracies, but we need to have a better way to coordinate with them on items like export controls, investment screening, trade and foreign assistance. And the third would be developing new and expanded partnerships with nations like India and Taiwan 
and, and Vietnam. And, and I, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with the secretary's aspiration, but I think perhaps there's more low hanging fruit in front of us. And I, I really do think in terms of international economic strategy, we have a huge opportunity to um, strike a free trade agreement with a variety of allies in Asia, um, particularly Taiwan, uh, and also build upon uh, a, build a, a gold standard free trade agreement with uh, the post-Brexit United Kingdom that we would have a docking provision in there that allows our allies who meet those very high standards uh, to join. And so you can very quickly start to see how we build upon existing alliance structures, whether it's treaty allies in Asia or the Five Eyes alliances uh, in the West, in order to sort of get at what the secretary wants without calling it a, you know, a league of democracy. The final thing I'd say, sorry to go on, is that, you know, it's clear to me that the CCP's advantage, uh, it's in their advantage to have the competition boil down to just the U.S. versus China. So our statecraft should be focused on getting allies and partners off the sidelines. You'll have to check me, but I think there was a Chinese academic, I want to say in 2011, who wrote it, and I forget his name, but uh, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, and he basically said the core of competition between the U.S. and China will come down to who has more high-quality friends. And I thought that was right back then, and I think it's even more right today. Well, okay, that's that's great. Let's uh, let's stick with this uh, your your um, the notion of new and expanded partnerships, and we'll shift gear into to to Taiwan. Obviously, given that our focus of today's uh, discussion is on on Taiwan policy. Um, the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Pacific Affairs, Dave Stilwell, recently gave a major policy speech at Heritage Foundation titled the United States, Taiwan and the World Partners for Peace and Prosperity. And in it, you know, he, he made some major, uh, some uh, notably uh, major adjustments in the U.S. approach, which includes the declassification of memos with regards to the, uh, to the six assurances. Uh, he also explicitly distinguished the U.S. one China policy and the PRC's one China principle. Uh, but among others, he, he he also in the printout of the uh, printout of the of his speech, uh, one of the subheading was uh, uh, was the uh, longstanding strategic clarity uh, on Taiwan, without explicitly, of course, uh, making any declarative statement about whether or not the United States will commit to Taiwan's defense. Uh, so, is that consistent with your reading of of of, of what U.S. policy is and what it should be? Um, uh, obviously, notably that you have been on the record on 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 advocating for strategic clarity on Taiwan. Well, first, you know, I thought Assistant Secretary Stilwell gave a great speech, um, one of many great public engagements he's been doing over the last few months, and I think it really did mark an important step forward in uh, the relationship, especially as you know you point out in differentiating the one China policy from the one China principle. That said, I actually think we can and should go further than just the six assurances. I, the fact is that strategic ambiguity, I, well, my opinion is that strategic ambiguity no longer makes sense uh, when you look at how the U.S. has pursued extended deterrence across the globe. Nowhere else do our friends and enemies have to wonder if the U.S. would stand to the side in the event of a conflict. Rather, I would say strategic certainty is the bedrock foundation built into Article 5 you know, of our entire alliance system. And so I think it's time we, we make clear to Beijing that there is no chance to initiate aggression against Taiwan and have it go unanswered. And you know, I know there's a, a debate within the, the, the China watching community as to whether uh, she is serious uh, about um, unifying Taiwan with the mainland uh, by force or fait accompli. Um, I tend to think he is. I tend to think this is a legacy issue. Um, what the heck do I know? I'm a recovering Arabist, but I try and talk to uh, as many smart people uh, that know the region uh, as I can. And so I know that's open for debate, but I, I think we should, we should, if nothing else, treat it as if not the most likely course of action, the most dangerous course of action. And I do think Taiwan is the center of gravity for global geopolitical competition uh, today in the way, you know, perhaps Berlin was back in the old Cold War. Now, uh, to pull the thread a bit on the earlier point about, you know, sort of uh, economic engagement opportunities with Asia, and I think this is part and parcel of the larger strategy that, you know, I think um, you're, that you seem to be you know, sort of painting in, in the various pieces that you've written. Um, and it's often said that 21st century is the Asian century. We've also made a point that the center of economic gra gravity is shifting to the Indo-Pacific and geopolitical competition centering around Taiwan. Um, in this context, what are your thoughts, of course, about recent calls for a negotiating a free trade agreement with uh, or bilateral trade agreement with 
with Taiwan since now President Tsai has announced her government's decision to lift uh, restrictions, uh, some restrictions on the import of U.S. beef and pork. Well, I, uh, I'm enthusiastically in, in support of it. Uh, I think it should be, um, you know, at the center of a, you know, a second Trump term foreign policy agenda, but I would say even a first term uh, Joe Biden uh, foreign policy agenda. I understand that there are some, perhaps those who are uh, committed to the, the phase one trade deal with China that worry uh, that moving forward would upset that. But I think we have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And I, I, I think a, an FTA with, with Taiwan would be um, maybe transformative is too big of a word, but certainly a big strategic win for both, both us and, and Taiwan. So I hope we will move forward. Um, I understand uh, the reluctance maybe within USTR or, or other places to uh, upset uh, General Secretary Xi, uh, but that cat's out of the bag. So uh, I, I don't know. Again, I just I, I view maybe I, I have a simplistic view, but I, I think we need to do, do everything possible to um, uh, strengthen our relationship with Taiwan economically, militarily, et cetera. Yeah. Congressman, you, you mentioned earlier that, that you, you admitted that you're not originally an Asia hand, uh, but obviously a Middle East uh, hand uh, expert, and, and can you? And I want to sort of broaden the scope a little bit for for a second here, and and because obviously there's a lot of developments happening in the mid Middle East now. And can you describe a bit what you see as the importance of the events in the Middle East for its impact on U.S. Asia policy, to U.S. policy towards Asia, uh, and and where, where do you see that sort of the connection? Well, the uh, maybe this is an admission against interest, but the truth is, I even though I, I spoke uh, Arabic and, and, and spent a lot of time in the region uh, when I was in uniform, I, I never felt like a Middle East expert either. I always felt like I was struggling to, to understand what was going on. So uh, I guess if you get elected to Congress, all of a sudden people start publishing your op-eds and thinking you know what you talk you, that you know what you're talking about. Um, but I do think it's connected, right? I mean, I think in terms of, again, to go back to the national security strategy and national defense strategy, which everyone seems to agree with the premise of that, even Trump's harshest critics, you know, if you accept the idea that the CCP is our pacing threat, well, then Indo-PACOM becomes our priority theater. And in, in much the same way that I think sort of late stage Obama administration was trying to figure out how to pivot or rebalance the Pacific, the biggest geopolitical challenge we have right now is how do we responsibly reduce our posture in the Middle East without creating a vacuum while enhancing our deterrent posture uh, in Indo-PACOM. I think the emerging um, peace deals between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain uh, allow us the opportunity to do that. They allow us the opportunity to sort of play money ball in the Middle East, or at least enhance a de facto alliance structure built in opposition to Iran, use you know a very modest investment of, of special operators in order to enhance local forces on the ground so that we can move more exquisite assets uh, to Indo-PACOM. I think the hard thing uh, that the DOD has to admit or, or look head on right now is that I think if you asked Indo-PACOM right now, are there any assets in theater that weren't there prior to uh, the 2017 NSS or the 2018 NDS, they would say no. Um, so we've made a rhetorical commitment to prioritizing Indo-PACOM over CENTCOM, not ignoring CENTCOM, but right now it's mostly a rhetorical commitment, at least in terms of, of military assets uh, and forces. And so, you know, in Congress, we have to do a better job, perhaps, of, of kind of forcing the Pentagon to implement uh, the national defense strategy. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the place where you work, which is, you know, in Congress now. And, and the U.S. Taiwan policy has been a, a remark, especially in Congress, has been a remarkable bright, bright, a bright spot for bipartisanship um, in recent years, especially with the Unanimous passage of the uh, the Taiwan Travel Act and 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 more recently the the Taipei Act the uh, the Taiwan Allies International Participation Enhancement Initiative Act I believe um, why why was why do you think that this has been the case this sort of this this congressional activism if you will and where do you see the role of Congress and and, and new initiatives that with regards going into into the future Great question I mean there again I see a parallel with uh, with the Middle East In fact I think if you examine the the history of, of U.S.-Israel relations, it would become uh, very clear that it was deep and widespread, uh, deep and bipartisan support for Israel in Congress that often led the way in building out that relationship um, at various times over 
executive brands recalcitrance. And, and similarly, I think it is interesting that Congress has been Taiwan's foremost champion within the U.S. government. I suppose one explanation is that as a branch of government, you know, we're, I mean, we're the branch of government closest to the people. So we retain an ability to see the forest for the trees. Um, you know, I think another way I think about this is in Mike Green's excellent book by More Than Providence, he looks at the history of U.S. policy in Asia. And the primary takeaway I had from his section on, on the modern era is that Asia policy actually shouldn't be that hard. Uh, you know, it kind of boils down to we should support our friends, particularly our democratic friends like Taiwan and Japan, and treat those that don't share our values like China with great skepticism. Um, presidents that have understood this, like Reagan, tended to do very well in the region. And I think this kind of moral clarity tends to come easy to Congress, uh, which, as you allude to, is again leading the way on Taiwan. Earlier this year, for example, I, I introduced and now I, I realize there's probably a lot in the audience who don't easily associate moral clarity with Congress, but uh, I'm making an argument here. Um, but uh, earlier this year, I introduced the Taiwan Defense Act with Senator Hawley, uh, which makes it U.S. policy to maintain the capabilities required to defend Taiwan, including from a fait accompli. It requires DOD to submit to Congress plans regarding resources and capabilities it needs to defend your island home. Um, you know, we were able to get most of the bill into the NDA on both the House and the Senate side, so I'm optimistic about it. And then finally, even more significantly, just a few weeks ago, I introduced, along with Representative Yoho, the Taiwan Invasion Prevention Act, which would formally end the U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity by establishing a limited authorization for the president to use military force to defend Taiwan in the event of an armed attack. So I view that as a historic marker, and, and I doubt we'll get that passed into law and signed tomorrow. But another example of where Congress is sort of if nothing else, provoking the debate that is long overdue between the branches. Mm -hmm. so, well, to focus a little bit on, um, on legislations that have been passed and signed into law, one of the ones that you know it seem, uh, is uh, quite remarkable, at least in terms of the broad scope that it presents, is the is the Taipei Act that I, I, I mentioned earlier. And and I just wanted to get your sense because it does, you know, this this legislation uh, does authorize a mix of carrots and sticks approach to enhancing, as you as you described it, um, enhancing Taiwan's international space. What more and should the, the United States be doing in terms of implementing the act to uh, to further the goals and objectives established by the uh, the Taipei Act? Well, I think it's a, a very good piece of, of legislation, um, you know, and this is not necessarily contained within the legislation itself. Uh, but one of the things that I would really like to see is the development within the Department of Defense um, and particularly within the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force of a cadre of, I wouldn't necessarily say Taiwan experts, but um, professionals that work consistently throughout their career with their counterparts uh, in Taiwan. I think it's that type of person-to-person um, -person relationship that uh, will be at the sort of... Uh, the foundation of, a, of an enhanced partnership. And we may also find that we can learn a few things uh, from each other as we try and advance the relationship in other domains, be they economic or, or ideological. And I think we might also learn a little bit about the nature of CCP coercion, um, of united front work and uh, things like that, which I hate to say, I think we have a very immature understanding of in the United States government. Um, and a very shallow uh, bench in terms of expertise uh, when it comes to United Front work. And for example, I think probably the, the person that, is, that has been the foremost expert on this, well, I would say two, one is Alex Shosky in Australia and the other is Anne-Marie Brady in New Zealand. Uh, and we're, we're sort of learning from them and I think it should be a wake up call for everybody here in America. So that's just sort of one area where I'd like to see us build on the intent of the Taipei Act, if that makes sense. Okay. Right. That's great. Um, you know, in, in a piece that you wrote, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, as a solution to counter the overall the CCP threat, you put forward the idea of a counter Finland Finlandization strategy. And, and, it, and then I want to relate this to Taiwan, of course, because uh, you know, our focus is the discussion. But th this has been an idea of sort of the Finlandization of Taiwan as being an idea uh, for Taiwan to preserve its autonomy in a way. Uh, and what do you think about that? What, what is your sense in terms of uh, A, well, A, what is this counter finalization strategy? And B, what, um, how does it uh, apply to, to Taiwan? 
Uh, great question. And just because you asked a hard question is not why I'm about to say this, but I've been informed that in six minutes I have to uh, head to head to the, the house floor there. Um, well, to me, to me, I think it all boils down to. Well, I think the, the first of all, I appreciate you reading that article. I think you're the only one who did. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I wrote it, I sort of envisioned myself as a modern day George Kennan, and then no one actually read my my much too long telegram that had no influence on the U.S. government. Um, but uh, I think the reason that I, I view counter Finlandization as a useful framework is because it should it should remind us in the U.S. that we can't assume from the start of this competition that countries, even those that we've worked with in the past, are going to agree with us on everything when it comes to U.S.-China competition. Or if nothing else, we need to respect for the position that even some of our closest allies, uh, like Australia, are in economically when it comes to China. So that's the first place. It's just sort of that understanding that there are a lot of countries that if you just sort of envision the Finlandization image as U.S., China, Finland in the middle, can waver between the two or or still believe that they can navigate between the two poles as the issue sees fit. And we need a we need an understanding that of that if we're going to be able to craft a nuanced strategy that's successful. But then the second thing I, I think is is just related to everything we've been talking about, where if there's a a maybe a thematic thread that I think runs through everything that the administration has done in the region over the last four years, whether it's just the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific, whether it's enhanced arms sales to Taiwan, uh, whether it's an attempt to invest more in Australia's first island chain and all the places like Vanuatu where we tend to we tend to neglect, it's this it's it it's a, a respect for sovereignty, right? It's 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 we don't want to force countries to choose between us and China, but we do want them to take steps to guard their own sovereignty. And we are prepared to expend a lot of resources to help them do just that. And so my that's kind of where the, the counter Finlandization idea came from. Um, and now I, I feel validated that uh, a couple of years after publishing that article, someone finally read it. <laughs> I'm sure other people have read it. Um, Vanessa. Uh, I'm certainly not the only one. Um, just, just CCP members. That's it. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. To the point about um, uh, uh, Taiwan again here, though, uh, former acting CIA director Michael Morell and retired Admiral James Winfield wrote, recently penned a piece warning about uh, in the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, warning about a fait accompli in the Taiwan Strait, especially warning that the United States could be basically caught sleeping on the wheel. Um, do you agree with this? sense of lack of preparedness or readiness uh, to respond um, to a surprise contingency in the Taiwan Strait? How, how worried are you about a, a, a imminent uh, crisis in the Taiwan Strait? Uh, I'm incredibly worried about it. And I, my, my worry is directly proportional to the level of political dysfunction happening in the United States. Because I know for a fact that you know our adversaries are looking at us tearing each other apart right now thinking, Man, this might be a great opportunity to make some geopolitical gains. Um, and I, so I, I, I share the concern. Um, all the more reason why I think we need a an actual coherent um, military strategy, some actual coherent operational art for how we intend to deter China uh, if necessarily defeat them. Should they launch a military invasion um, against Taiwan, uh, I think we need a broader strategy for for lack of a better term, helping Taiwan turn itself into a, a porcupine so that it is unconquerable in any traditional military sense. And I think finally, yet another reason why we should move on from the policy of strategic ambiguity. And again, I know that's controversial, but just the other week you had Richard Haas, uh, yeah. you know, arguing for that. I mean, that's a, that's a sea change uh, right. right there. So I think that should be a signal to the foreign policy community. Congressman, I'm going to leave it with this last question here. Now, uh, we often hear, and I, and I would often say, among especially you know supporters of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, uh, that we should learn from President Ronald Reagan and in terms of his approach to to Taiwan. Uh, there's of course a lot of memorable things that he's done as as far as the the declassification the memos have showed. Uh, you reference uh, President Dwight Eisenhower a lot in your writings. Uh, he happens to also be the only uh, sitting U.S. president to have ever visited Taiwan. 
what can or should we learn from Eisenhower in regards to Taiwan policy now? Oh, that's such a great question. Well, this week we're the, we're celebrating the uh, the at least partial opening of the Eisenhower Memorial. Um, well, obviously Eisenhower was willing to go to great lengths to defend U.S. Uh, the U.S. position and our allied uh, structure uh, in the region, uh, as declassified documents from throughout the 50s reveal. Um, but to me, Eisenhower had a great natural sense for what Kennan would call the strong points of, of geopolitical competition. In other words, you can't, if you defend everywhere, you'll defend nowhere. You really have to go through that painful process of prioritizing between the core and the periphery between the essential and the extraneous. And as I mentioned before, I think any honest analysis of a map, any honest analysis of US-China uh, competition reveals that one of, if not the global strong point in this competition uh, is Taiwan. And I think Eisenhower would appreciate that. Um, and it's why he took such great pains and invested so much of his personal time to go through the process of strategy design and implementation really since the very beginning of his administration. The final thing I'd say is Eisenhower had a very uh, a very great phrase that he would often deploy when dealing with subordinates. And he'd say, now boys, let's not make our mistakes in a hurry. And I do think it's useful, particularly for those of us like myself who favor an internationalist foreign policy, perhaps have a more hawkish view of US-China relations right now, just to make sure that we're doing everything we can to build a bipartisan foundation for that approach. And Eisenhower really believed in that. And throughout his administration, he was often arguing against isolationists within his own party and working hand in glove with, with Democratic members of the House and the Senate. And I really do think, not to sound too Pollyannish, uh, that we have an opportunity today to rebuild a bipartisan foreign policy foundation uh, on how to compete successfully against China, and certainly the overwhelming bipartisan support in Congress for Taiwan, I think, is, is evidence of that. Oh, thank you, Congressman, for that truly terrific and wide-ranging discussion. I know that uh, we can uh, we we'd love to be able to have you on and and and, and, and continue this conversation. I learned a lot. I'm sure our viewers learned a lot as well. Uh, so so thank you very much for your leadership on these issues, and uh, and take care. Well, thank you, Russell. Sorry, I got to go vote. It's a problem with uh, Congress. Occasionally, you have to vote. Uh, but thank you for sincerely. Thank you for having me and everything the Global Taiwan Institute does. It's really it's incredibly important, and um, you know, I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, this concludes uh, day one of GTI's 2020 annual symposium. Uh, please remember to tune in again tomorrow starting at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for an opening keynote by the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, Dave Helvey, as well as two panel discussions covering economic security and trade and defense and non-military coercion, uh, and as well with closing remarks uh, by AIT Director Brent Christensen, the de facto U.S. Ambassador to Taiwan. Stay safe. 